Welcome to Tone Talk, episode 44 with Dave and Mark. Tonight's special guest is, tonight's special guest is Richie Faulkner. Uh, so psyched to have Richie Faulkner from Judas Priest on the show. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you, man. How are you? I'm very well. It's a pleasure to be here. We've been looking forward to doing this for a long time. So, uh, no, it's a pleasure, man. Looking forward to what we're going to talk about, you know? Yeah, well, we got lots to talk about. We never know. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. The night is young. That's exactly. True. That's exactly. true. And Dave, how are you? I'm good. Richie, thanks for being on. It's that's awesome. a pleasure, dude. Thanks for having me. Yep. Yeah, it's. Uh, we were excited. I mean, what a week to have you, and to have Jakey e. Lee all in the same week. It's like, wow. I mean, I'm like, uh, we can end the show right now. So. <laughs> yeah. We haven't uh, talked about anything. Yeah, I know. But I'm just like, wow, man. This is just, you know, I'm, I'm talking about after the show, obviously, not right now. But yeah, I'm psyched. I'm totally psyched about it. So um, I know we've got a lot of people watching the show, and uh, we're going to get a lot of questions. So people who have questions for the show, please post them in the chat, and uh, we'll get to your questions. Um, I know I've got a bunch of questions. I know Dave does as well and um but please let us know what questions you have and we'll get to them we also have a super chat so make sure that you guys jump into the super chat if you want your question to rise to the top and we'll get to that as well as soon as possible um uh i already see that equinox is saying what are we drinking it's friday <laughs> sorry i'm i'm uh dave's not drinking Perrier. yeah <laughs> dave's drunk dr uh, what's the word? He's all drunk. Mark, drank. drunk already? Uh, <laughs> Mark's had enough. No, Mark's had enough. No, all more. drank he's out. He's all drank out. of a beer and he's fine. I haven't even taken a sip yet. <laughs> Whatever he's drinking, I think we should have some because he seems yes. to be uh, seems to be no, working. No, I know. I can't not speak. Me. <laughs> so I, po I poisoned myself Monday. Yeah, you had a rough a rough time. So, oh, so that's what it was. That's why you're not drinking tonight. Now, now I'm putting oh, the yeah, pieces together. Oh, yeah, that's what it was just Monday. And it's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm good for a couple months, I think, maybe. <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. I'm on the Malo tonight. I'm on the, uh, I was on the, the, the lagers earlier on, so I'm kind of chilling out a little bit tonight on the red wine, trying All to right. be a little, little bit classy. Very nice. But, yeah, it's going down quite well. Cool. <laughs> cool. Um, I, Dave and Richie, I just sent you the... Um, the link to the show if you'd like to share it it's in the conversation of uh the skype oh okay that's complicated mark can you send it me in a, t in a <laughs> yeah i can do that too no problem so richie how long have you been off tour now because you guys been you starting up soon again right yeah we got off we got back home uh it was a couple of weeks ago um where do we get back from we we done a, a last minute date in tokyo japan uh, because Ozzy pulled out. Ozzy obviously is uh, not, you know, in good health at the moment. And he was playing uh, the Download Festival in Tokyo and uh, couldn't do it. So they called us up and, you know, Japan's a great place for priests. They love priests. They, you know, they love their metal and, you know, guitar music in general. And they called us up and asked us if, if we'd go over there last minute and headline the festival. So we did that. Um, and it was at the end of a short run of uh, Australia, New Zealand, um and then that one in in tokyo and we've been back a couple of weeks now and we go back out again i think it's the third of may and we start in the in the u.s we start in um there's a new casino new uh hard rock casino in hollywood florida and i live about 40 minutes north so we're rehearsing um you know about a week before so it's, it's nice and easy for me i can stay at home for a few uh, for a few weeks and then just rehearse not so far away and then uh, we kick off the next leg on the third of may in hollywood Florida. So, uh, yeah, we're looking forward to it. I mean, you know what it's like, you get off the road and there's more stuff to do at home than there is on the road. So, um, <laughs> you know, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's great to be you're, you're all taken care of on the road and yeah, you get home, you've got to buy like toilet paper and shower where's gel the... and ketchup wait, and stuff. You know? Where's dinner? Oh, wait, I got to make it. Don't worry about <laughs> it. We're going to go somewhere. Exactly. Wow. But yeah, so we're looking forward. We're actually, um, uh, you know, obviously this has been a, this leg has been a long time coming. So we've been thinking what we can do different on this leg, really. It's the third leg in the States on this firepower tour. So we're looking at 
different things, different stage set, different, a few different songs and stuff, you know. So uh, it's exciting, you know. We've been changing the set list around quite a bit on this on this go around. So uh, we del delved into the the back catalogue, pulled out a few old ones, a few new ones as well, and you know. So it'll be it'll be interesting to see the, the fans' faces when we surprise them with some songs that they might not expect. Oh, I'm psyched. That's that'd be good. That's exciting. Yeah, super. Mark, cool. you gonna go? What's that? You gonna go, Mark? I'm going. Okay. Yeah, I already have tickets. Oh, of course, because you're, you're in Florida as well. So. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, Hollywood, Florida, literally is. Uh, you know, I'm in Weston, so the hard yeah. the Hard Rock's right down the road, literally like 15 minutes away. So. We did it on the uh, on in two. 2015, I think it was, but that was the old one, and I think they've demolished it and done the whole complex up, if I'm not mistaken. It's like a new hotel and new casino. And yeah, yeah. So they are in the process of renovation, and that 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 hotel that is in the shape of a guitar. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a, a super. Cool. Have you seen a picture of that, Dave? No, but is, what is it similar to the Vegas kind of uh, facility hmm. that they're doing? I haven't seen the <laughs> Vegas facility. Oh. Yeah. I mean, this is literally. <laughs> This is a hotel in the shape, giant, like like ten stories in the shape of a guitar. How American is that? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you don't get more America than that, you know. But you know, that's why we're all here. <laughs> yeah, and it's super cool as you dr as you drive down the, uh, the the turnpike. It almost like becomes like a like a parking lot because people just are slowing down just to look at the guitar that this giant guitar in the sky. But um, it's pretty cool. That's a it's a cool place, but I, I didn't know that they uh, redid the arena there. I wasn't sure if they redid that or not. Oh, I might be mistaken then. They might not have. Yeah. I mean, I do know we're doing uh, the Vegas one, the Vegas Hard Rock, in June at the end of June, and I think we're doing the Joint, and I think that's the last show at the Joint as it is now. I think Branson bought the the Hard Rock franchise, and I think he's changing it all around. So that the, the last show that we do on the run is the last show at the Joint in in Vegas. So uh, it'll be sad to see it go, but we'll see what, you know, comes in its place. You know when in June that is? It's right at the end. It's like the 30th or the 31st or something like that. It's right at the end of June. So It's kind of funny. The, 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 the joint there, the Hard Rock, is the first time I saw you play with Priest, I think, which on your first tour with them. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, it was Zach cool. Wilde opening up in uh, Thin Lizzy. In Lizzie. That's right. Yeah, yeah I, me I remember it well. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. good. It's a nice small room. It's nice and sweaty. And it was, I remember as well, it was kind of like a stripped down show the first time we did it. Because I remember that on the Epitaph tour, it was all bells and whistles. It was pyro, it was lasers, it was massive, you know. So to get it on that stage, we had to scale it back a little bit. And it almost made it, you didn't rely so much on the production. You had to really sort of, it was the band playing the songs and the audience. It was almost more magical, if you know what I mean. It was really, yeah, it was, it was almost like really video, video backdrop or whatever there was with the different album covers and, and different yeah. things like that. Sometimes yeah. that that creates like a really special vibe, you know, when it's stripped down and it's just a band playing the songs. It's what it's about, really, at the end of the day, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Right? Exactly. That's what it should be about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not always the case anymore, but... No. Um, That's true. So, here's the question. Where did you start? How did you get started? Um... You, know, you mean with, you mean go with back, priest, go back in, in your life? <laughs> oh, you mean like guitar? Yeah. How'd you how'd oh, you start yeah. playing and take us back? Yeah. Well, my dad was a, a huge Hendrix fan. He, he was into Hendrix and Purple and Thin Lizzy and that mm. sort of stuff. And um, that's good parenting he, right there. Yeah, and as you do, you sort of um, kind of push it on your kids, I suppose. You know. Yeah. Um, and it was one of those things that. Oh, you know, how can that not, you know, someone shows you Voodoo Child by Jimi Hendrix or uh, I think it was House Burning Down is the one I remember by Hendrix. How can that not kind of resonate with anyone, any human being, the sounds and it was it was mind blowing, really, like it, like it was for anyone. But um, like the twin guitar stuff, the Thin Lizzy and Blackmore in purple and, and then also the, the, the visual of Hendrix, you know, it was like VHS tapes and uh, I think we had Jimmy at Monterey and Jimmy at um, Atlanta. And so was a, I think I was maybe six or seven, um, seeing Jimmy, like anyone, was just uh, just a, an assault on every sense, you know. Um, and it was just, 
how can what is that how you know you want to find out more about it and my dad had friends at the time in local bands um like local punk bands local rock bands and one of them had actually lent him a guitar and it was this old it looked like a double cutaway like either a melody maker or a, a junior or something like that and he got this kind of bright red luminous fluorescent paint and painted it and then splashed yellows and greens and purples and blues all over it and so it's like you know like a punk band does yeah. and um and i learned a few chords on that and my dad showed me a few chords and um just the interest went from re there really you know you got, you got your first guitar a couple of years after that and your first little amplifier and you know you learn your songs on the records and lifting up the needle and going backwards and forwards and all that sort of stuff you know but um what a pain. just well but there, there's all there was always there's always some sort of obstacle to overcome you know whether it's the needle on the record or whether it's a, a scale you can't play or whatever but i think there's there was always a healthy amount of interest and just enough ability to be able to approach it and have a go at it, get a little bit frustrated, but the interest kind of drives you through. You know, there was a healthy balance of two. I think if, you, if you've got loads of interest and no ability, it's, it's a bit one-sided. And conversely, if you've got, you know, all the ability and no interest, it's going to go the other way as well. It's not going to work. But there was like a balance of the two, and I think it just played off each other. You know, I'm not the only... This is nothing new, but it just... Um, that's the way it worked, really. There was just yeah. in, enough challenge for it to be interesting uh, and enough interest to uh, face the challenge, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Totally, totally. Yeah, it, to it, to it totally makes sense. We talked about that a little bit on that the last podcast we did, so um, that uh, interaction and, and, how, and how with records and when you were learning songs off records, everyone kind of learned it a little different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And because and and, yeah. and, and, no one knew exactly what was right and they weren't quite getting it right exactly. Mm -hmm. and it, uh, but it was, it was close enough for me as a kid to sort of like, oh, that yeah. sounds <laughs> close enough. Sounds close enough. I'm going to play it that way. And it's still yeah. the same, man. We play some of those old priest ones and it's like, you're not quite sure um, how, you know, exactly what it was, but you can get so close, uh, hopefully, and get away with it. But, um, you know, and then from there, you get in cover bands, and I got in a cover band when I was, I think, maybe 13, and it was all older guys, and one of the guys was used to be in Iron Maiden, um, I think his name was Tony Parsons, so he used to be in Maiden um, before Dennis Stratton, I think, so right. there was a bit of history there, so we play Maiden and UFO and Hendrix and Sabbath and Priest and Maiden, and, you know, and then you kind of cut your teeth on the live circuit in front of people, and... Uh, no one cares and everyone's at the bar and there's maybe three people there but you sort of you learn more than just playing the instrument you know you learn about the live aspect and the sound was a big thing you know how to be heard and how to play your part in the band um and went from there really and i learned a lot in that band we used to play every sunday um in camden in camden town in london and i don't know if you guys have ever been but it's kind of like a um it's a real kind of you know, there's clothes, there's shoes, there's like... Yeah, I, I was just there recently. Oh, yeah, wow. there's a bit of, bit of pot down there. It's always, they've always had great bands down there. Always been that sort of... Hippie is the wrong word. Hippie is the wrong way to describe it, but it's very sort of free. A um, lot of different styles down there and stuff. A lot of different bands and music. So we used to play down there every Sunday from 3 o'clock in the afternoon until 12 o'clock at midnight. So it was a long time. And without knowing it, you're learning so much about the instrument, the sound, the people interacting and all that and um you know it's it didn't it doesn't really get any better than that it's kind of that's what you do it for the, mm -hmm. the music and the songs and the crowd and um and a few pints at the end of the night you know. <laughs> exactly if that's probably what you got paid well, well you know <laughs> right? exactly right <laughs> in, in, in uh you know in england you, you can't walk more than two feet without hitting another pub so that's very true. And there's, in every Literally. pub, there's like a, a, another band in there. It's great, though, because like, you know, some of the Irish pubs is, are the ones we used to play in. And some of the Irish pubs, would, they flew the flag for live music. You know, if it was an English pub, there would be some DJ in there or, you know, again, nothing against that. But it wasn't what I was into. But you go to an Irish pub and they'd have a band in there. And you could always rely on the Irish. You still can. You can go to an Irish pub in Slovenia. You can go to an Irish pub in... Barcelona, and he'll be a band in there. And you can go and you know 
just have a great night. So, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, <laughs> is it is it still like that? I, I'm not there anymore, but um, I know Camden is. Camden has changed a lot from from what it was when I used to live there. But it's still kind of um, what's the word? It's, it's kind of there's always something different in Camden. It's like the village in um, in New York used yes, to be. You know, yes, yes, yes. That, that sort of vibe. Um, there's always something different there. So it changes a lot over time, but the sort of the heart of it is always uh, there's always bands. There's always um, cutting edge sort of fashion and you know. Well, there's of... that club. There's that club. <laughs> club yeah, there's that club there at the underground. Is it? The underworld. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Underworld. That's it. Yeah, that's underworld. It, yeah. Yeah. Um, I remember when I was just there, uh, we were on Camden and I'm looking at this place, the, the underworld, and I'm like, on, I've been here. And then I remembered back the last time I was in England, which was uh, like, yeah, I don't know, 15, 16, 18 years ago, something like that. And I saw Joe Strummer before he died mm. play at that club. In the underworld. Under, yeah. Hot as hell. Yeah. Oh my God! It was just like you go downstairs and it's it's like a hundred and two degrees. <laughs> yeah. And what happens in a lot of those places in London? Because you know you get the bands in there and the bands are on to eleven, and then they turn turn it into a club. So you, you do a gig in there, and then there'd be someone in there cracking the whip, getting your stuff out, and you just you're sweating. You know your hair's a mess or whatever, and uh, they want to turn it around into a club. So whether it would be like an alternative night or a gay bar or some sort of event that they're doing. Um, cause they're making use of the space, you know, so you do your gig and then just have to get out of there and, um, mm -hmm. and then go down the road for, a, as I, as I said, like a few drinks, but, uh, but it's magical Camden. I lived there for a few years. It's, uh, it, it still is nice. When we, whenever we go back there, we go to Camden. It's always, it's always magical. Now, where are you from originally? I'm from North London. So not far, not far from Camden. Oh, wow. Okay. Now I read, and I know Dave, you wanted to ask this question. We we read that you you were a hot dog salesman. Or, <laughs> is that yeah. is that true? Yeah. Okay. Um, so tell us about that. I was because I, I, you know typically you know, sometimes you read something on Wikipedia and it, it could be completely you know wrong. So I was curious. No, I used to I used to live in Sweden. Uh, I when I was about 16, 16 17, I, I moved to Sweden for a few years, and like like you do, all the jobs you have as a musician. Uh, are ones that enable you to, you know, be free at the weekends to do gigs or, uh, you know, because you weren't earning a lot at the weekend, you know, doing shows, but that's what you wanted to do. So you'd work Monday to Friday in a bar to to buy a, an amp or buy a, a guitar or whatever it might be, and you've got the weekends free to play. Mm -hmm. uh, so in Sweden, it, it was just an extension of that. It was um, just doing whatever you could do to pay the bills. So gotcha. you, it would free you up at the weekend. And, uh, and I had a great time. I mean, we used to do, initially, we used to get in a get in a car, you know, get in a van and throw a load of equipment in the back. And if there was an event or a festival or some sort of, you know, concert, we used to drive there and sell, sell hot dogs. That's what we used to do. And it was like the, you know, New York City where you've got the, um, I can't remember the name of them, but you've got the blue and yellow uh, umbrellas and they stand there in the street with a grill. And oh, yeah, that's exactly, like, like yeah, so, sure. so, so Brett. I think it's, so, right, that's it. yeah. Yeah. so it's, it's exactly what it was. And, uh, and again, just doing whatever you could do really to make a buck and, and buy that piece of gear that you wanted, you know, or pay the rent. That's Usually fantastic. Have the piece of gear first, you know, it just, I saw that on Wikipedia and I was like reading, I go, and he worked as a hot dog seller. I'm like, wow, we got to ask him about that. <laughs> yeah. That's I mean, awesome. Hey. I, I remember it because it was a Swedish interview that um, they found out about it, obviously. And uh, she said, "What you know? Do you think you'd ever do anything like that again?" And I missed the opportunity. I should have said, "Well, I don't know. What are the hours?" You know, like a Nigel Tufnell kind of. Thing. But, um, <laughs> I, I, I didn't catch it. Be great. Yeah, but um, but yeah, you know, you do what you do. Like everyone does it. We do what we do um, to kind of uh, to finance what we really want to do. Where where our passion is. Well, yeah, it makes total sense. I mean, you're just scrapping together money. You're young and mm -hmm. you're just trying to make ends meet. And it was good fun too. Don't get me wrong. You know, as I said, we travelled around a lot, and uh, yeah, it was good fun. Met a lot of people. And, uh, yeah, travelled in, 
done the, done the hot dog stuff and that's a bit like gigging really <laughs> you know fly and do the gig and, and fly out so uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah which is that's so cool because oh. like you're actually you know you're doing the gig and then you're also selling hot dogs at the gig and you're like now that could be a thing that could be a thing on the next tour i could like you know do the do the show and then put me hot dog van up and start <laughs> <Exactly>. up. <laughs> 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 Judas Priest hot dogs. I mean, I know Nico has uh, the restaurant over. Have you ever been to Rock and Roll Ribs? I did actually. It was really good. And funny enough, I was in there and uh, Ripper Owens came in. Oh, like, wow. Coincidence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, he turned up on the same night. That's so but, cool. uh, And they're really good ribs. Sometimes you get these guys that open up restaurants or bars and it ain't really that good. But Nico's ribs are really good. I was impressed. His place is great. I go there you know, any time that I head over there, which is by like Sam Ash and the Guitar Center over there, and mm. uh, I'll just head over at, at at Nico's place, and yeah, it's 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 great. Yeah, the food's really good. Yeah. The burger's good. Yeah, he's got some good stuff. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, and I've seen him there too. He also has like a heavy metal day, like once a year. I think I think his son, his son gets out there. It's really fun. It's really fun. yeah yeah. It's very cool. So yeah, that's that's awesome. Um, so that's tell cool. us, so tell us more. Tell us more about you know the next steps. Uh, what led you down the path of you know becoming a pro musician? Um, well, I, I remember you know I was playing in bars and stuff as I said, and, and doing bar work during the week. And um, in the meantime, you you do like original bands, you know, um, as and when you can. You're always trying to kind of hone your craft and uh writing always interested me you know um creating songs not just playing them but creating them um so you have a few bands that you're in and you you're trying to make you know you're trying to make it you know mm -hmm. um and one of them was a band called uh dirty deeds and uh i think they had three records i don't know the third one it was the first band that i actually got in that was a signed band i think we were signed excuse me by sony so i was 21 and, uh, you know, I was in a signed band, you know, and it was cool. We released a record. And then from there, we went on to, an, you know, made it into another band. And there was a connection there with Steve Harris from Iron Maiden. And um, through that, I got to play with Steve's daughter. He called me up. I was in a bar one day and my phone rang. And um, it was Steve on the phone. And I sort of knew him, as I said, through the band that we, that we were with before, through that connection. And, um, and he said, do you want to go out to Miami on Monday? This was Friday. He said, do you want to go out to Miami on Monday and do a session with my daughter? She's put a, a thing together um, and she needs a guitar player to, to do a session. Do you want to go out to Miami on Monday? And I'm thinking, well, I mean, I mean, you know, wherever in London selling lagers and whatever. And someone's just asked me if I want to go out to Miami on Monday and, and do a session. So I said, absolutely. So right. I, I gave him a notice. And, and went out to play with Lauren. Um, and that turned into, it was a session which turned into a band, which turned into a tour with Maiden and Thunder. I don't know if you guys know Thunder, like Luke Morley, Danny Bowes and all that. Um, who else was it? We'd done a tour with Motley Crue, Within Temptation. So it turned into a turned into a band thing. It wasn't just a session in the end. Wow. Um, and from there, we released an album. Uh, and the second, we were doing a second one. And uh, I got the call from Priest Management, and um, and the rest is history. Really, it was um, they they called me up and they explained a little bit of the situation. They needed someone. Um, they didn't explain the whole situation at the time. I wasn't. The, I didn't have the gig, so they didn't want to give too much away. But now we know what the situation was. Um, they needed a guitar player, and um, I went down and met Glenn and Ken. I remember I was just telling uh, my girlfriend this actually. We. Um, I got the call. I didn't have any money, so I had to borrow the. I had to get on the train and go up to Glenn's house, and I didn't have the money, so I had to borrow the money for the train fare off my mum to get on the train to get up to Glenn's house, and then uh, I had to chat with Glenn and Rob and the management, and we went from there. And um, it was really low key. It was really down to earth. It was really kind of like the three of us just talking about stories and stuff, and there was no ego. It was all very inclusive and. Mm -hmm. The, the amazing thing was um, we discussed what they wanted and they told me what they wanted, what they didn't want. And the amazing thing was they asked me what I wanted and what I didn't want. You know, what was I looking for? Which which kind of brought it home to me that this was, they wanted someone in a band. They didn't want a stand in. They didn't want a hired gun. Mm -hmm. They wanted someone in the band and they were kind of sensitive to what that person wanted as well. You know, so it was a pretty incredible thing. And they've always been like that. They've always been inclusive. They've always 
been, uh, you know, what's, what do you think? What's your opinion? What should we do here? And I think it really kind of, because I always said, you've got, an, you've got a, a viewpoint that no one in the band has got. You're coming in from the outside and you might catch something that they've missed. And again, I just think it's a testament, really, to a, a mindset that they had, not to be kind of dictatorial or anything. It was like, you're in the band, this is a band, what the band feels is right, you know, and it, they're, they're like that to this day. So it was really, it's an education, really, to see that, you know, yeah. you can imagine some bands being a bit sort of, there's two guys, maybe, that call the shots and this is what we're doing. This was uh, this was a bit different, and it kind of that's what you expect your favorite bands to be like. But you hope that know, they would be like that, right? It, it, exactly, and they yeah. were, and it, they were heroes before, and they're, they're bigger heroes even now. You know, they're like brothers, and you learn a lot from them, and uh, you learn you learn stuff every day. Even even today, I'm learning stuff. You know, so it's it's a great education. That's incredible. Now, how did you get recommended for the uh, the gig? How did that work out? Well, what it was. Funny enough, you know, it's a cliche that, you know, it's not what you know, it's who you know. But um, playing those uh, gigs in Camden, in London, uh, we played with, you know, there, there was a there was a core band. So it was like myself, the singer, the bass player, the drummer. And then every now and then we'd have people come in and guest. And some of them guested on a regular basis when they weren't touring with other bands. So we had Les Binks come in from uh, Judas Priest also. He played like on, on East in the East. Stained Class and uh, albums like that. He would come in, every, you know, every Sunday and, you know, do the late set on drums. And then there was a guitar player called Pete Friesen who used to play with Alice Cooper. Um, I think he was with Alice on the... I think he was on the Trash Tour. And I'll tell you what he was in. He was in... Um, remember the Poison video? Mm -hmm. um, he was in Poison, the, the Alice Cooper video, Poison, um, mm -hmm. but he was playing bass. Because I don't know if you remember, but the the Poison video, they're all silhouetted. You've got Alice in the front, and you've got the the band members in the back, but they're all silhouetted. You can't see yeah, who they are. I think I, so, it sounds familiar. Yeah, I mean, I remember yeah. the video definitely. Yeah. So Pete was playing bass. Pete was miming bass, and he actually said to Alice, "If you need a guitar player on the road, I will play guitar." And Alice said, "Well, I do actually. You come on the road." So I think he'd done Trash, uh, Trash is the World, um, and a few other tours. Hmm. And to cut a long story even longer, um, no, we got time. <laughs> Pete, came, uh, Pete used to do the late set with, with Les Binks. So I used to play with Pete, and Pete always said to me, you know, if anything comes up that he can't do, um, he would always put my name forward. He, he thought I was a great player, a great guy. I got on well with him. You know, it's all about the relationships. You know, it's more about, not so much about, you know, playing guitar gets your foot in the door. You know, but if you're a good guy, it's the relationship that kind of kind of get us through that door and, and go, get us further. So Totally. Um so Pete got the call from Priest Production because Priest Production knew him from another band called The Almighty. I know this is a long story. You've got to stay with me here. Oh, we're with but, you. Um, so The Almighty, um, some of the production guys, some of the crew uh, worked with The Almighty and they knew Pete. And they said, well, Pete might be able to do the Priest gig. So they called, Pre uh, they called Pete and Pete, um, he respectfully declined. He said, uh, you know, I think he had a few other things going at the time. And I think he just had a little baby boy, you know, so there was some family life going on as well. Right. And so they asked him, um, can you recommend anyone? And so I was one of the names that he recommended from, and, and this was maybe six or seven years after I played with him in, in the, in the bars, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that was it. And he gave him a number and uh, that's how that's how they got in touch with me. And, and by that time, you know, YouTube was there. I, I had a few two, few things on YouTube. Um, I had a bit of a pedigree with Lauren. And the great thing about Lauren was, the priests told me they wanted someone that um, uh, they didn't want someone known um, because that could come with baggage. You know, you could come with demands, or you know, you never you never quite know what you're getting. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want someone that was completely unknown either. Um, and the great thing about me doing Lauren was that I was unknown, but I'd been around the block. We'd done some big tours with Maiden. Right. Um, so I was kind of, you know, that, that Goldilocks moment, like when the porridge is just right. It was right in the, yeah. you know, no one knew who I was, so I hadn't been around the block. But I, I knew, they knew that they could trust that I knew what I was going to do on stage. I wasn't going to freeze up. I wasn't going to get stage fright. I'd played in front of those sort of crowds before. Mm. So I was right at the right place, really, for what they seemed to want. And... Uh, so yeah, I was you know very fortunate. I mean, you're an amazing fit for the band, 
I mean, it's, it's amazing. I mean, I, I you yeah. Know. When yeah. when I first saw you with them, I'm like, oh, breathe new life into Priest. Oh, thanks, guys. Yeah. Because it was, it was uh, there was a little more energy and a little more, you know. Yeah, I think you know. You're younger than. Yeah. You know, predecessor and come that comes often with more energy and more. Yeah, design. I think it, you know with, with it, whether it's a, maybe if it's like a football team or an office, I think if you change something in it, the dynamic's going to be different. You know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But, um, you know, it's hard for me to say what the dynamic was like before I was in it because I, I wasn't there. But, you know, a few people have said the energy's, you know, lifted. And, you know, there's five guys in the band. And, you know, we, we're all pulling together. And, um, you know, so we're all kind of passionate about what we do. So I can't take full credit, you know, if we're doing it for 50 years. No, no. I don't think you, you can't do it for 50 years without being you know, that into it. So maybe I just, you know, lit a little bit of a spark and then we all went from there. Yeah. And the writing is just fantastic. And it's just, you know, uh, I, I love the, the latest album firepower. It's just, thanks man. Yeah, no, it's killer. Absolutely. I mean, I was hoping that it'd be nominated for like a Grammy. Um, I thought, it oh, should, you know. I thought it should be, I was like, come on, this, this, uh, you know, a heavy, you know, heavy metal album. I know they're not going to air it on TV. God forbid they do no. that. But, <laughs> but at a least long you, time ago they did stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, so like back in the '80s or even the early '90s. Um, but yeah, I mean, I was so pumped about that album and still am. I'm excited to see it live. So, um, can you talk yeah, about uh, how you prepped for the audition? I mean, beyond you know just meeting the guys and everything, what was like? Did, what songs did you have to learn? And you know, how did you prep for that? I'm curious. When it wasn't. Um... An audition as such it was the first day i went there and i met glenn and rob i took my guitar they said bring your guitar mm -hmm. um so it wasn't like these are the songs you have to play us and stuff but so i went into the um into the studio glenn's got a, a home studio so we went in there and um glenn i think there was like some sort of amp that he put me into i can't remember what it was but he said he's gonna go and make a coffee get situated, get your sound right and, you know, get comfortable and I'll come back and listen to a few things. So he went downstairs and I got myself situated. Unbeknownst to me at the time, Glenn was at the bottom of the stairs listening. So it was probably the best thing anyone could have ever done, really, because like if someone, you've got Glenn Tipton there, sitting in front of you, yeah, looking at you, say, you know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so so I think he, he, he was sensitive to that. And so he, he was at the bottom of the stairs listening. But, um, so when he came back up, he said, you know, obviously he said he's seen some stuff on YouTube. He said, I've, you know, heard you play now. Obviously, you're a competent player. What they want to do is um, they were looking at some songs for the upcoming set on the Epitaph Tour in 2011. And they wanted to see what I'd do with some of those songs. So um, he said, go away and record the solo parts, like Ken's solo parts for, um, I think it was Blood Red Skies, um, Victim of, no, Blood Red Skies, uh, Beyond the Realms of Death and something else. It might have been Victim of Changes. Uh, he said, you know, do your own interpretations of those solos and, and, and kind of send it back to us and we'll see where we are then. So I did it. I went home and I did like a little uh, recording setup. So I recorded my versions of the solos um, and, then, uh, and then took them into the management. Uh, took it like a little CD, burnt a little CD, took it into the management, and she took it up to Glenn. It was about a week later they called me back up there, and I'm th I'm like quietly optimistic because I'm thinking they wouldn't have called me back. Like it was a few hours away, you know, back on the train, mm. get the money off mum, get back on the train, go. Up. So I'm thinking, <laughs> uh, you know, um, so they're not going to make me go out of my way. I'm, you know, maybe it's a, a the next step in the audition, so to speak. Um, but it, you know, I was in Glenn's kitchen and he said the gigs yours if you want it you know he was he was he loved what i did on the on the um on those uh songs that i sent in um and uh and that was it really and do you know what i think that was i was, I was talking about this a couple of days ago that it was maybe if that was i don't if i can't remember what date that was where i actually got it got the gig and glenn told me that um i got the gig but it was literally i mean we were out on the road I think they announced it a month later. And then three weeks later, we were in the States doing American Idol. 
So it was three weeks after they announced it publicly that we were out pretty much on the road uh, in front of 30 million uh, households on American Idol. So it went pretty quick, you know, once once they announced it, it, it was full steam ahead because I think the, the tour was booked already at that point. There were contracts in place and they were ready to go. So I think when Ken pulled out and I came in, it was like full steam ahead, you know. So wow. that was kind of the initial process. And uh, again, it was a lot. We spoke a lot and we, you know, sat there and we had a few beers and filled each other out. And I think there's a lot to be said for that, you know, aside from the, the playing point of view. You, you live in a lot with these guys. You know, you're going to be, there's five of you. You're on buses, you're on planes, you're on it, like security lines. Mm -hmm. You've got to get on with each other. And I think that's a, that was a main, that was a big part of it. Um, so yeah, and and that was it. And then we were on a tour in in Europe, and then we went to the States and South America, and we were off, and uh, and that was it really. So the audition process was kind of very low key, mm -hmm. very um, organic, informal, like. organic. Exactly, exactly the word. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, it wasn't forced. It was like, okay, let's just see if this works. And uh, yeah, yeah. So when you were doing the solos, where when you say your interpretations, were they? Um, were, did you? Uh, try to just go through the like the lines of what the other solos were or uh, of the the original songs or did you just really do your own thing no it was definitely it was definitely based on the original okay definitely based on the original solo they, they told me uh, um, they didn't want to clone um, they didn't want someone you know using Ken's gear or his sound they, didn't, they wanted someone with his own stamp I mean unfortunately I had blonde hair <laughs> you know what I mean I couldn't do much about that but um so and, and I've always been that sort of player, you know, playing playing in the cover bands again. You kind of there's the original solo. So if you're playing a Lizzie solo, if it was like um, whiskey in a jar or something like that, you know, you had the the original solo, but there was always kind of leeway for uh, interpretation while keeping the, the the motifs that made that solo magical. Mm -hmm. You know, so it was always part of the way I played anyway. So. Uh, the way I approached KK solos was no different. They were, and it wasn't a case of, oh, I think this sh this bit should be this. It was like, well, this is what the so this is what the solo is trying to say, and then a few little bits here and there. It's just the way that you play, and it's slightly different, but it still says the same thing, you know, without trying to overpower it and do it. I wasn't like sweet picking over a, a slow passage, you know. It, it was trying to keep the 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 message of the solo, but just maybe just doing your, your thing on it, respecting what was there, but doing your own thing as well to some degree. And we, I think we're fairly similar players anyway in some re regards. We're fairly improvisational. Mm -hmm. we, we rarely do the same thing twice. There's a few notes in there that are different all the time. So I think me and Ken are, are similar in that respect. Yeah, no, that's that's awesome. Um, so, bam, you're in. <laughs> there we are on a tour bus. I was homeless. You Years later now. I was homeless. I, I could... I could uh, give my mum back the money for the train fare. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So she was happy about that. But um, yeah, and then you know, it's funny how it works. I joined them on the Epitaph tour, so it was a farewell tour. And uh, I think the band always said they'd do more dates, but they wouldn't be full blown world tours. But you can see how it happens. You do a world tour on Epitaph, and it fires you up. You're playing in some of these beautiful countries around the world to beautiful fans, and they love Priest, and it kind of inspires you to do new music. Mm -hmm. How could you not be inspired by that? And so you go and do new music and that inspires you to go out on the road again. So there you are on the Redeemer of Souls tour with a new album, Redeemer of Souls. And it's the, cir the circle goes around again. So, and here we are in 2019 now, um, eight, eight years later. So, um, so yeah, that's how it works. Oh, it's, it's, it's that's insane. not the only band that's ever done that. <laughs> no, I know that, I know, I know. <laughs> I know, that's true. I remember The Who when they, when they had a farewell tour and that was well, something like 30 years ago. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, uh, they're about they're about to come out with an album. I think yeah. really I didn't know that. Is it, yeah. is it? Wow, okay. Yeah, you know, on their, on their on their last uh the last tour they played great. They yeah, were really in the zone last tour. You were tour. saying I that. Saw some I saw a lot of footage from it and stuff. I'm like, wow. Yeah. It's the songs, man, those songs and the voice, you know, Roger's still killing it, you know. He sounds, saw him. sounds great, yeah. Sounds great. Looks great. You know, Pete's playing great. It's Pete's brother as well, isn't it? Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Is it Simon? Simon Townsend. Yep. Yep. Uh, and Zach Starkey. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think band. he's still in it. I think. Yeah, he's. Yeah, he is. Yeah. He is, yeah. yeah. And they had uh, the whole um, on the screens. They had uh, 
John Entwistle and Keith Moon and parts of the show. And it was, you know, it was, it was a really great testament to them. I mean, they, they were part of the, the heart of that band. And um, it was good that they acknowledged that, you know, so it was a really great show. Roger, yeah. Roger sounded great, you know, and full of life. You know, he's, he's like, I don't know, he's like 70 something. Yes. He's, he's got more energy than some of the people my age. You know, I'm getting up there now as well. But, you know, he's uh, he was great. He's, he was enjoying it. You know what I mean? And it was great to see. Yeah, it's inspiring to see. It's it's yeah. fantastic. You know, really good stuff. So, how was what was it like to uh, like one of your first gigs was American Idol? Yeah. <laughs> so, what was that? I mean, I know, I, I, yeah, it's wild. I, I, I think I remember seeing that with with Priest on on American Idol. What 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 do you guys do? Uh, living after midnight or? Yeah, it was a medley with living after midnight and breaking the law. Yeah. Well, there you you go. Go. One way or the other, I can't remember. Uh, I think you're right. It was we living off the midnight break of the law, mm -hmm. um, and it was kind of just I don't know. It was weird. It was. Uh, I mean, there was like J Lo there and Steven Tyler, and you know, <laughs> there's like the guys, the judges and stuff. And it was weird. It's surreal because I, I, I was watching the show because uh, James Durban, um, he got so far in the in the contest that he was gonna even if he got voted out, which he did, he was still gonna make the finale. So we were all aware of this, and it was about the same time that I was, I, I got the gig, and um, so we were all we were all watching it, and, uh, and then all of a sudden you're on the other side of the camera, and um, sometimes you know when you're a part of a production like that, it takes the magic away, but sometimes yeah. it doesn't because the, the the amount of work and showmanship and production that goes into that it almost makes it more magical that something live comes off like that on that sort of scale without a hitch. And uh, it was it was great to be a part of, you know. And, uh, and and again, I think, you know, Priest for me have always been about flying the flag for heavy metal. And um, and that was a, a great opportunity to do it. I know a few people have questioned, you know, why did you do that? It's very unmetal to do a, a, a mainstream pop show. Yeah. But um, we always saw it like it was a great opportunity to get Priest into 30 million homes mm -hmm nationwide i mean that's not even worldwide you know so uh again flying the flag for metal it was announcing a new tour new guitar player and um that's the way we saw it really and james sung his balls off and um yeah it, it was just a great great opportunity and then the first gig after that was the first real gig if you want it was in holland somewhere and that was a total blow i don't remember anything about that that was like you know maybe i you know i had a few beers and went on i just don't remember anything of it but you just you know you get on you get it's on like it's like monday it. night for dave <laughs> oh yeah exactly. <laughs> i remember a lot of the night i know i'm just kidding i'm just joking it's those little parts that flash back and you're like oh no well, the, the, the problem yeah yeah like you're like oh, i remember that and then oh wait that's missing oh wait oh yeah i remember that but there's like pieces you remember and pieces you don't you did a phone call the day after. Said, uh, "Did did I say anything? Did I offend you in any way?" Cause, you know. <laughs> well, you know, the funny the funny part was it's uh, it's like you know yes we sat there and drank the bottle of scotch but um, and it was a four hour show so you know it's it's long so you're yeah you just keep going and you're then you're like eh, oh shit <laughs> yeah like you try to stand up and be like whoa after four hours but then we went to dinner after <laughs> wow. Yeah. So it's probably probably more of those. Where, where he decides to order this drink because it's a place he he goes sometimes, and I'm just like, all right, I'll have whatever you're having. It's fine, you know. And it was an absinthe. Oh uh, my god! It was an absinthe-based drink. Are you serious? So, which was uh, on the sweeter side. So, um, yeah, it doesn't yeah it doesn't go very well with the <laughs> scotch. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I'm alive. Yes. Good. If I offended anyone, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, you didn't. I don't think you offended. I apologize. <clears throat> it was fun. Richie's a great. I mean, uh, but like, but like one person wrote me in an email. He goes, you know, it's like it was like watching two people sit at a bar talking to each other, right? <laughs> until they were just until the end of the night. You know what I mean? <laughs> and uh, so it, you know, it was a shoot the shit show. And he's very entertaining in his stories. Yeah, Jake was Jake was cool to have on the show. But he's got a few stories as well, right? Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, he has a lot of them. Yeah. Killer player. Like, you know, as I said earlier on, I was watching that um the rig rundown thing that he did. I don't know yeah. I don't know which one it was. But uh he's a he's a 
for being that um, era of guitar players. Yeah. He's a very meat and potatoes guitar player. He's like a very, he's a hard hitter. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was impressed really, you know, it's amazing yeah. these days where you can watch things like that and, he's and a hard, find out. Yeah, he's, he's, a, he's a hard hitter, but at the same time, his uh, uh, chord choices and, and how complex they are is what's really Without crazy, that. unheard of in that unique player rock genre of music. Yeah. Because, you, you know, again, it was, you know, I was kind of young at that stage, but, you know, getting into it afterwards, there was a lot of guitar players around that era that sounded the same. And I think intentionally so. They wanted to sound a certain way. But you yeah. had guys like uh, um, Jake, it sounded like he was intentionally trying to be different in that, yeah. in that sphere, you know, and uh, really carved a niche for himself, you know. Well, especially, you know, during that era, not using a bar, right? Yeah. No Floyd. Yeah, no bar. Yeah. No Hardtail. Floyd. You know that was exactly. Yeah. yeah. That, I mean, and all the techniques that he did just to compensate for. Okay, well, if I have to do, you know, a, a band, if I have to get a little bit of trim going on, well, I'll just bend it at the nut, or I'll do whatever the things that he did to compensate yeah. for it was super cool. Yeah. I mean, he he was definitely one of those top players back then, and uh, yeah. he was super super cool to have on the show. Um, it's a great like, mindset as well, you know. Like someone could easily put on a on, on a tre on a what do you call it over there? Like a you don't call it a tremolo arm, do you? You call it a a whammy bar, right? Right. Yeah, right. Or, or tremolo arm, either way. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a great mind. Like you can see the mindset of the guy. You can easily put a a, a whammy bar on there, but he said, "No, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to find alternative ways of doing it." And that, that's it. That's a great mindset, you know. Yeah. Well, he said he goes if I had a if I had a tremolo arm on it. Uh, I would just take it way, way, way too far. <laughs> so, so he goes, no. <laughs> yeah. Now I see you prefer uh, you use a Floyd, right? I use a Floyd. It's it's a it's a relatively uh, new thing. I've always used a, you know, kind of throughout uh, the time really. I've used a Floyd every now and again, but usually I was always a Les Paul guy or a, a V or an SG with like a stop tail piece, and it's only been really regularly since priest that you need it obviously you know um what was there before with ken he was uh it was heavy on the on the whammy bar so um it just frees you up really to explore that avenue of the guitar so mm -hmm. um but yeah i use it a lot and it's not i don't use it um excessively it's um when when playing his stuff without a doubt it's really heavy whammy bar use but um when they own stuff, it's kind of um, a bit more, a bit more subtle, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, it's definitely a, a cool tool to have in the arsenal. Do you um, do you notice a tonal difference from going to the Floyd to when you used to have the, uh, the stop tail, or or you're cool? You know, you don't notice much in terms of tone. It's a good question. I think every guitar, I find every guitar's got a different voice anyway. You know, so true. Unless true. unless you put the Floyd on a guitar that you're used to, you could only, that only then I could make a, a comparison really, but because it's a different guitar anyway, um, it's hard to tell. It's hard to say really. Like it, the, the the Floyd Rose guitar, that's the way it sounds, mm -hmm. um, and you just kind of work with that really. But um, a lot of people do say, you know, especially with like the, the Big Spears and stuff and the, the Floyd Rose, and if you put a, a, trim, a whammy bar on there, it does change the sound. But I've never really noticed it to the point where it's uh, getting in the way of anything, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Still, I mean, your tone still sounds great, so. <laughs> oh, thanks, sir. thank you. Yeah, I haven't, I, I, I haven't, I, I'm not hearing anything, any loss, but I was, I was just curious what your thoughts were coming from the Les Paul and, you know, that kind of, that kind of thing. Um, so who were some of your influences? I know you talked about, you know, you lit, when you were a kid and you were talking about Deep Purple and Blackmore and, you know, and so forth like that, but, who, who did you grow up on that, that led you down the path of playing the way you do? Um, well, there was, a, there was a time when it was it was just, I mean, like the early stages was, uh, you know, as I said, Blackmore, mainly Rainbow, you know, it was more Rainbow than Purple. Mm. Uh, Lizzie, UFO was a big one. Um, and there was a time after that when, you know, it was Maiden and Metallica and that was it. That was, you know... That was all I listened to. A little bit of Pantera, maybe. Um, but I was made in Metallica just all the time. Um, you know, the, 
it just I was really into that thrash thing um, and Maiden as well. It was just otherworldly, you know. Mm. And then, you know, and then the other stuff that I was into in my childhood, like the Lizzie and the UFO sort of crept back in now. You know, ACDC and Ozzy and the Sabbath and all that came back again. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's uh, it's always always goes back to Hendrix and Floyd, Queen, um, Lizzie, UFO. UFO's a big one. UFO's, uh, Schenk is a big one. Um, you know, it was always Zach, the Iron Maiden guys, um, you know, that new wave of British heavy metal stuff. So Maiden, Priest, that, that sort of twin guitar twin because that sort of stuff to me sounded like an uh the next extension of lizzie mm-hmm. you know you had um totally agree you know, yeah you know that, that sort of thing I, I got it it was oh this I, I knew what this was this was this is where it was coming from and uh, i sort of got that the harmony guitar and stuff um but Schenker was and still is you know he's my favorite guitar player alive really um i mean it, it, he he was out with us um in the uk in 2015, I think it was, mm-hmm. and uh, he opened up for us with, I think it was Michael Schenker's Temple of Rock or something like that. Wow. Anyway, well, I went out and watched him every night from behind the cabinets and just <laughs> e- everything about it, like the note choice, the yeah. technique, the tongue, the uh, the, the songs, the uh, everything about it, every, everything uh, from rhythmically, um, everything about it was a masterclass in in rock guitar and uh you know the phrasing the melody you know it's not all shredding it's you know just really nicely crafted pieces it's just fantastic he's my favorite guitar player alive without a doubt um so you know he's been a big one uh hendrix uh zach obviously as i said um you know i don't think there are really any secrets there i mean you know murray was a big one from mine made and dave murray and adrian smith mm-hmm. and i think you can hear the you can hear schenker in uh, adrian smith as well there's you know his vibrato and his note choice and his phrase and you can hear schenker in there um they were the main ones um so, they were in hetfield really so being the big uh schenker fan did you see um the eddie trunk or metal show thing where Shanker played with Kirk Hammett. I did see it. Yeah, I did see it. Not a lot of it. I sort of that was that was relatively amusing to me. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Kirk's a massive Shanker fan as well. Uh, yeah, but he's a little out of his element. Well, I think anyone would be with with yeah. Schenker, You know, not from, yeah. not only from a fanboy aspect, but you know, Shanker's just such a classy. I mean, what I don't know what you'd play around Shanker because you've got to, you've got to be you're on you know that metal show. As a guitar player, you've got to be impressive. But how can you impress? How can you do anything impressive around that guy? Because if you yeah. play, play like a million miles an hour, right. he's going to play three notes and blow you away. Like it's that guy. Like he's, and if yeah. you play three notes, he's going to shred, and it's going to be some sort of neoclassical melodic. He's just he's fantastic. So I think anyone really would be out there. Element. I think Kirk was just happy to be there. You could like he was grinning yeah, from the <laughs> Yeah, he was loving it. You know. So uh, as anyone so, would, I'm sure. Is that the yeah. one where they gave away a guitar or something like that? I remember that. I can't remember that episode. They gave away like a Schenker guitar or something. I can't remember. Um, sure. Yeah. I don't remember. No, that's funny. Um, super cool. We actually have a cool question um, from, uh, I'm, I want to just recognize some people in the chat. I haven't been going through all the chat, so we have to go, I'll be going through the chat and questions for people uh, soon. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking. So um, Richard Henry says, "Hey guys, 2 a.m. in Northern Ireland. Hope you're all doing well." Richard, you're a trooper, man. Thanks for uh, joining us. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for watching. Yeah, no doubt. Um, so uh, Blimpus says, "Richie, favorite priest song to rock on stage?" That's a great. That's a great question. Um, there's so many good ones. Some of them we haven't rocked on stage yet. You know, this like songs like. Hot Rockin' and um, Ram It Down. We haven't played ever, and I'd love to play those sort of songs. But I think the ones that I've played so far with the band, obviously songs that I've had a part in writing with the band have a, have a different different connection. You know, you've been a part of them, you've written them, you've given birth to them, if you know what I mean. So they always have a, a different connection. Things like Halls of Valhalla um, and the new ones, you know, Firepower, Rising from Ruins, that sort of stuff. But yeah. as far as classic priests, you know, things like the Sentinel, 
Judas Rising, Victim of Changes, The Sinner, um, Free Will Burning. Um, That's a good one. Uh, I'll tell you another one we've done recently was um, Killing Machine. That was wicked, just like a great groove. Um, Devil's Child. I mean, dude, they're all they're all great. They're all fantastic. <laughs> and the first two I did with them, I think we'd done like two and a half hours, and we did a song or at least one song from every record. So it was like right through the back catalogue, and you know, we did uh, um, what was that? Um, Never Satisfied from the first record. I tell you what, it'll be good to bring out. Um, because we've been bringing out a lot of songs. We've got like a jam room backstage. I know this is a long answer to the question. No, it's but great. Like, um, nothing, thought, nothing seems to be too long on this show. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> good. Um, we've got like a jam room so we'll, we'll get, you know, we'll warm up back there and someone will throw a, an idea into the hat. So a good one would be something like Rock and Roller, like um, Rock and Roller Woman. Something like that. That would be a great song to do. I'd like to do that. Because, you know, that was on the, uh, there's footage of that on the old Grey Whistle Test, which was a show in, in the UK back in, like, it must have been 73, 74, I'm guessing. Um, great song off the first record. So I'd like to do that one. Um, what other ones? Judas Rising is a great song. Uh, uh, Night Comes Down was a good one. We've done that on the last, on the last couple of legs on the firepower tour. I mean, the list goes on. The list goes on, and they're all great for different reasons. Tyrant, um, you know, Painkiller, All Guns Blazing. We haven't done that one yet, but uh, we might do. Um, yeah, so the, the list is endless. Yeah, that's, cool. that's I can't wait. Can't wait to see the the new songs you guys are gonna do. Killer. Um, so uh, we we do have a super chat um, comment, and uh, this <laughs> this is a first. <laughs> <laughs> this yeah, exactly. is a, yeah. Th this is uh, someone who's uh, paying paying us to give a shout out for them, paid promotion for them. So, really weird. Uh, Richie, please check out Will Wild, a great harmonica player who fronts a hard rocking band that tours UK and Europe. Will Wild. Will Wild. That's what he said. I'm writing it down. Writing it down. down. Look at that. <laughs> and there you go, Will Wild. Cool man. Thanks for the thanks for the donation. Um, we appreciate it. So I, there was a question earlier. Well, Harmonic caster said though he's not Will. Oh, but you know there's a. Oh really? A, oh, so that's okay. That's interesting. Okay, cool. Sorry, Richie. Go ahead. No, I was going to say there was harmonica on that first record as well. Uh, on the first priest record, there was some uh, yeah, harmonica. Us. Yeah, yeah. So it's like it's like the wizard with Sabbath, you know, like every now and then they're throwing something yeah. uh, off the wall. So. Yeah. We, visit that, we visit that as well. That'd be cool. That's right. I'm the Wizard, when you just brought that up, it totally popped in my uh, head yeah. of what, this, what that sounds I just like. Heard, I, just heard, I just heard that song the other day. That's great. It, I hadn't heard it in a while. It was on satellite radio. I'm like, oh, yeah, I love this song. <laughs> <laughs> it's good stuff. Good. Oh, it's totally. Um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, you mentioned Ozzy before getting sick. Uh, we certainly will uh, hope Ozzy gets better. Um, yeah. 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 Fingers crossed, because again, we, we were supposed to be out with him in March, and then uh, I think Megadeth was supposed to be out with him now in the States, and then we got our dates postponed until the fall, and then obviously everything's been canned this year. I mean, the priority is his health, you know what I mean? I mean, Aussie... Yeah, I think, I think he's supposed to be okay, because yeah, they're already starting to yeah. reschedule in the following year, but um, I, I think he's over all that pneumonia and, and all that stuff. Uh, it's just, I think he fell or something when he... Yeah, he messed Supposedly up. Supposedly, messed up. Fell that. when he was sick. Yeah. yeah. And then he messed up an injury that he had before from that SUV thing, and I don't know what he had to have done. Yeah, yeah pin like there were pins and stuff that he had in, and like. Oh yeah, they yeah. they dislodged or something. Yeah, that doesn't sound. That sounds painful. So <laughs> I hope he's alright. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's cool. So um. He seems pretty tough. Yeah. He is tough. He's, How old is he now? He's, he's been through all of that, and he's still here. I know, right? Amazing. It's pretty, it's pretty crazy. <laughs> and, uh, he, he's got to be, what, 71, 70, 71? I think he's the same age as Glenn. Uh, oh, wow. So I think he's 70, 71, something like that. Could be wrong. But he's, obviously his health is priority, so, you know, he doesn't owe anyone anything, I don't think. You know what I mean? Like, in terms of you know, what he's created over the years. So I think everyone's on the same page. They want him to get better oh, and yeah. then come out and, and do the, the dates and play again uh, a thousand percent, you know? Yeah. I mean, you know, he wow. can, he can actually retire and not even play anymore. As long as he's healthy oh. and be fine, I'd be happy with that yeah. too. So 
fine. Yeah. Um, here's a good one from Reza. Why Epiphone and not Gibson for the endorsement? Well, um, I approached, approached Gibson initially. I was in contact with Gibson, and um, they liked the V that I was using. They thought it would be they thought it would be uh, something that the, the guitar players would like. You know, it was a, essentially it was a V with a Floyd, um, with uh, Les Paul appointments. You know, um, and we thought that instead of putting out, you know, a, everyone knows what Gibson custom shop cost. Um, yeah. Instead of doing that, it would make more sense. You know, a lot of people in Europe and the US are, are younger younger people, you know, they, they may be between 15 and 30, you know, there's, there's a big age group, a big age bracket there. Mm. Um, and not everyone's got five grand, six grand, seven grand to shell out on a custom shop guitar, you know? Mm. And, um, so we thought that if we go with Epiphone, which is obviously a, a, a connected company with Gibson, um, there were, I think the top 10, there was a top 10 of guitars in that kind of bracket. And I think four of them were Epiphones, you know, in the top 10 of guitars in that sort of bracket. And um, so the idea was to put it in as many hands as possible that, that were people that were into the band and, and would be able to, you know, it, it's not a $200 guitar, but it's, it's a substantial guitar. You, you get a pretty good guitar for your money. So we decided to go that route. And then later on, if it did well, we could then maybe do a Gibson Custom Shop later on if it did well. So... Um, but the that was the reason for doing it, really to get it in as many hands as we could. That um, makes sense. Yeah. yeah, you know, because otherwise you price yourself out and no one buys it, no one cares, and you know, no one wins. Right. No, it's great. I mean, well, let's just say you're playing that guitar on stage and mm -hmm. it sounds fantastic. So, Epiphone, well, Epiphone Gibson. I'm not sure it makes a difference. I mean, are you playing a stock guitar? That's the you know, or do you have any upgrades on it that that would I've got um, the, there's one that uh, that had a bit of a had a bit of an issue with the with the Floyd Rose on it, so I changed that one out. But that's only on one of them. I think I use I use the, the I use a Gibson, and then I use the the signature version of the Epiphone of that, and then I've got two spares, and one of the spares had a but it was a, it was a faulty or something went wrong with the with the whammy bar, so I changed that out, and that's the only thing I do different. They they come out the box. I've done a few interviews with them as well, so. I think one of them was um, Guitar World, I think it was, and I've done just done one for a young guitar in Japan, and they had a guitar there for me, and they, they literally got it out the box, they got it out of the, the gig bag, and gave it to me. It was in tune, it was set up, and uh, we done the, we done the video interview with it, and uh, nice. so they literally come straight out the box, and you know, obviously, uh, we change strings every night, we make sure they're set up every night, but they're essentially what you get on the wall. The, the difference with the Gibson one. Um, uh, it's, it's a different. I think the Floyd Rose is different. I think it's a different model of Floyd Rose. Right. I mean, it's, it, it's got to be a lower. Probably the higher end German yeah. one. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But as far as the Epiphones, the Epiphones I use on stage are the Epiphones that you you buy, you know, in the shop or on online now, <laughs> as the case may be. But yeah, they're, they're exactly the same. Right. Right. Yeah. Razor says makes a difference, Mark. Yeah. Okay. Well, Gibson Epiphone. I'm, I know. I know. But yeah, it's. Um, it's still, he, he well, made, it's, uh, there's know, some tone it, in his fingers that are sounding awesome. So go ahead, Dave. Sorry. I mean, yeah, it really just depends on the wood that's used and the pieces and the pickups that are in it and the bridge that's on it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And the player. But, but then again, you can get two guitars with exactly the same, same woods. You know, this Yeah. same different. woods, so, totally different. Can we swear on this, by the way? Can we curse on this? I, oh yeah. I know oh, oh, we can. Can. All right. All right. I don't usually, but um, I'm a good boy. Uh, but um, yeah, you know, so two guitars can sound totally different with exactly the same spec. So, you know, who knows? You know, it's, it, as you said, there's a lot of it in the fingers. There's so much, there's so much it goes through the string to the pickup, to the wood, to the capacitors, to the cable, to the amp, to the, who knows? Like if, if, I, if I plugged in the, the Gibson and if I plugged in the Epiphone, I don't think anyone would know any, any different. If they did, Ben hats off to him because I can't tell the difference. You know, it feels different. It's a slight. If if it didn't feel different, um, you'd wonder why Gibson are charging what they charge. You know, there's a reason why there's those sort of tone woods and stuff, and why some guitars cost this much and why some cost this much. You know, mm -hmm. but uh, 
the, the core of the guitar is the same. And it, it's, we're saying I use it every night, and um, they're fantastic. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. We have a, a question from uh, Craig or Guitar Wannabe. He says, how much of Tipton's playing was actually on the album? Um, firepower. Album. Firepower, so, I gather he means. This is a question that comes up quite often. And it's um, everything that Tipton... Tipton played all the rhythms. Mm -hmm. I played rhythms on one side. Glenn played rhythms on the other. Um and then I played my guitar solos, and Glenn played his guitar solos. The way it's always been. I think the the um, is there like speculation on the internet or something that? Yeah, and I think you know, I think I know where the, the speculation came from. Although it was never worded this way, it was kind of implied somewhere that um, Andy Sneap did more than just produce the record. And I think the implication got into it as you know more guitar than any than he should have um i think that's i think why the speculation has come up and obviously glenn is suffering with parkinson's at the moment mm -hmm. um so people say well how could he play a record well obviously in the studio you've got the you've got the luxury of time you've got you know you can go over pieces you can do it at your own leisure playing live is a different beast you know you've got to do it right first time uh a thousand percent correctly and uh, I don't think Glenn felt that he could deliver a thousand percent and, and pull back. And I, I make him right for doing that, really. I think if you're not giving a thousand percent to the fans that pay money to come and see you, uh, you know, I think you made the right decision. But in the in the studio scenario, um, as, again, you've got the luxury of time. You can take your time. You can go over parts. You can patch it in. You can drop it in, mm -hmm. and get the best possible performance. Um, and anyone anyone that listens to the record, you can hear it's Glenn. You can, he's got um, not only his solo stuff, but the way the songs are constructed. There were some things, it was great, you know, like when we were writing, whenever we were writing, it's me, Rob, and Glenn, and sometimes you're not going to see eye to eye. And it gives birth to something that, you know, either me or the other people didn't think of. So if someone's got this idea in their brain and it sounds kind of unorthodox, and I'm thinking that doesn't make sense. That doesn't go well with that and it doesn't make sense. And Glenn would be the first person to say, we'll, we'll try it. And uh, it sounds unorthodox, but we'll try it. So you do it a few times. And it's like, that's fucking great. <laughs> you know, yeah. and no one would ever think about it. So not only on the solos and the playing, the rhythm point of view, but from the writing point of view as well, Glenn was, you know, it was me, Rob and Glenn that wrote and, you know, the whole record. And, and Glenn was very much a part of this record. And, um, you know, anyone that can't hear that, you know, I mean, it's a shame, really, but you can you can hear Glenn all over it without a doubt. Yeah. I so mean, I hear it. That's for sure. So, so talk about the two producers on the record. Mm. So you had the original. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot his name. Um, original producer that produced all the classic hits of Priest. Mm. And you have a new school metal producer, Andy Sneap, mm. who's great. And you really can hear it on the record for me. It's like I, I hear the that old school song stuff with the new, slightly more modern production. It's funny, man. You know, a lot of people say that, like the 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 new but modern. I think it's funny at the time when you go into the writing sessions or even the recording sessions, and you put down the drum tracks or whatever. You never quite know what you're going to come up with. You know, you've got this batch of songs, a batch of demos, or a batch of ideas. But even with that, you don't know how the end result is going to be, you know. Um, and it did seem to come out with that classic yet modern touch. And in hindsight, I don't, th I don't know if anyone, I don't think we were thinking, let's do a classic but modern priest record. Yeah. We were just, uh, we were trying to do the best priest record we possibly could, you know. Um, and we were going through, we had about five producers that were kind of, we were talking about, you know, they weren't necessarily uh on the cards we were just they were names we were mentioning throwing around what about this guy what about that guy he's doing that you know and the two guys that kept coming up were andy sneep and tom allen who as you said dave uh i think he mixed unleashed in the east mm -hmm. and then produced uh from british steel right up until and including ram it down so it was a good right. good almost 10 years there um and we, we kept coming up with these two guys. And I think it was actually Glenn 
in the end that said, well, why don't we get both of the guys together? Um, maybe we can work with both. Because we just couldn't decide, you know, what approach to take. And both had merits. Obviously, as you said, uh, Tom had been had that uh, that history with the band that you can't you can't deny, you know. But also, Andy was someone who was a bit more current. I think Andy's been producing for over twenty years. Yeah. But you know, for all intents and purposes, he's like the modern go-to uh, metal producer on the block. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so we got them together and we we discussed what we wanted to do and what we wanted to try. Um, and they got on like a house on fire. I don't think they'd ever met before, before that point. So they got on really well. Um, I think they went out on their own as well and had a few pints. I don't think Andy drinks actually, but, uh, you know, at a, at a drink, I know Tom drinks, I know Tom likes a glass of wine, but, um, so they went out and they discussed their own things as well. And I don't think anyone at the time knew how well that was going to work. It could have gone, it could have gone horribly wrong. It could have been a disaster. You know, you could have had two guys with fighting, fighting, you know, equally right, strong right. opinions, but different, you know, opposing ways of going. But uh, they, it got to the point, it was it was quite romantic in a way. They were like finishing each other's sentences and everything. It was quite cute to see, you know. So they would like, one of them would start saying something and the other one would finish it. Mm -hmm. So they were both on the same page. And the great thing about it as well was that they could concentrate purely on that and we could concentrate purely on writing recording capturing playing and forget about mic placement um you know you've got the the, the history of tom allen with the band you can trust him you know he's the one that's going to tell rob halford no that wasn't very good you can do that better no one else is going to say that but tom knows tom's got that relationship with him mm. and ultimately that's to get the best out of rob you know and, and rob trusts him he said okay well if tom allen is saying i can do better I'm going to do better, and he does it, and it gets the best out of the band. And and Andy was great too, you know. He's Andy's a guitar player as well, as, as we all know now. But um, he, you know, we threw him into the out of the frying pan into the fire. You know, if he ever done a solo album, we should call it that, out of the frying pan. Into the fire. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but he was great, you know. So and they both worked really well. They they made us play live. They made us play and rehearse. And record the songs live which i don't think the band have done uh, since painkiller so that was i mean it's almost 30 years ago since they've done that you know with the with the advent of the internet and everything like that it's, it's made it possible to record at home send stuff via the internet web you know uh, but something's lost you know I, and i think it was the first time i'd done it like that and you can really feel the benefit when the band's playing together and you're You've got the demos, everyone's learned their bit, and you play the song together, and you've got Ian thundering away, and Scott and Rob. And um, if something's lacking, you feel it pretty much straight away. Like, this, this is lacking a part, or this is too quick, this needs to be brought back, or this needs to push a little bit here. You, you, you feel that when you're playing with human beings. If you're playing to a click track, or you, you're recording something and you record it, you only feel that when you get in a rehearsal room together for the live tour and think, oh, this should have been a bit faster, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, and it inspires you as well, especially with, I mean, I was blown away by Scott Travis. Scott's, again, he's got everything as a drummer. He's got finesse and groove technique. He's got time, everything. And um, so we're playing the ideas, we're playing the, the demo songs that we'd learned and we're putting bits and pieces in and Scott would do something spontaneous. And through that spontaneity, it fires us up and you, play with that and you lock in and then you do something yourself that's equally as spontaneous to match that so it raises the bar mm. and it, everyone's kind of raising the bar um and the producers were pretty instrumental in in getting us to do that to rehearse the songs to lock in together to fine tune the songs based on what we were feeling in the room not just based on what we were hearing through the studio speakers what we were feeling and what it needed yeah. and it was uh i don't think i'd ever I mean, if I ever get, you know, if I'm in the situation to do it, I don't think I'd ever record a record in a different situation. I mean, the music ultimately benefits for it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and that spontaneity as well, you, you get it on tape, and then if you need to recreate it, you recreate it, you know, with more conviction or whatever it might be. But um, those initial sparks of inspiration 
that come out, of, who knows where they come from. They, they get captured on tape and you can refer to them, you can do it again. And again, at the end of the day, it benefits the track, it benefits the record, and it benefits everyone's performance, hopefully. Um, and, you know, it seems luckily with this record, it really seems to be connected. I don't know if it's because of that solely, but, um, you know, that, that definitely is a big part of why this record, I think, sounds so cohesive and so exciting. Mm -hmm. And that was, uh, getting back to what you asked, it was really primarily down to the producers that wanted us to do that. Great. Yeah, that's awesome. Recording a band old school, properly, I, I would call. Proper is the word. <laughs> without a doubt, without a doubt. Uh, as a band is the way to go do it. Totally. It's humans. You can overdub like, later, you can do, but the basics, that's the way to do it. It's, it's the human element. It's like the humans interacting, and stuff always shows up that wasn't there before, and that's what makes it to tape, and that's what makes it magical, hopefully. You know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, I mean, uh, having the two of them, this, uh, you, I, I hear both of them in that record, um, and uh, it, it was a pleasant surprise on how good the record was. Oh, thanks. Uh, thanks. You know, it sounded, sounded killer. Thanks, man. Can you, um, which goes to one of our viewers' questions also, Brian McKenzie said, can Richie give us a mini, rugged, mini rig rundown? Um, but I was curious if you can also, um, not only what you're using now, uh, but what, what did you use to record the album, uh, Firepower? Uh, what was like the main amps that you use, guitars, so forth? I'm curious. Well, the main, um, I know we, we tried, um, different cabinets. There were different cabinets. There were, there were old vintage cabinets. The, the interesting thing was we, we were we got quite um, methodical about getting a good guitar sound, like a good bass guitar sound, and it was amazing. You know, we had some old vintage guitar cabinets. I don't know what was in them, but they were old cabinets from the seventies. With you know, again, I can't remember what was in them. But the word vintage is overused these days as a term of quality. I think you know that just because it's vintage or whatever means that it sounds good. It absolutely doesn't. You know, we we had these. <laughs> I'm telling you, we've got these yeah, vintage true. cabs, and we put them, you know, with some, some mics or whatever, and they sounded all right, and we've got these new, brand spanking new cabs. Again, I don't know what, I don't quite remember what they were. I think we had Marshall cabs, we had Crank cabs, Engels. Um, you know, we tried a few out, and nine times out of ten, the, the, the newer cabs, hands down, smashed the vintage ones. You know what I mean? I, I think a lot, of, a lot of stuff these days is... Uh, a lot of credit is given to the, oh, it's vintage, it must sound good. And people, maybe people hear it differently because it's vintage. Well, right? well I mean, part of that has to do with speakers. I mean, uh, if they've been abused in cabinets for years and years and years, I don't care if it's a vintage greenback speaker. I'll be right it back. It sounds like food. Oh, without but a doubt. Just without sounds doubt. tired and, you know, there yeah. are a few that sound really good, yeah. but... In general, yeah, speakers get tired, they get worn out, they get dried out. They're they're they've been beaten to death with hundred watt marshals for for uh, you know a million years from the '60s on, and you know yeah. uh, you'd be tired if you were beaten with that much power after yeah. for a while too. It's the same with guitars as well, you know. I find that you know some things are it's a vintage. Well, you know, it's funny like these days you got a, like an '82 is now a vintage. Like you've got an 82 Les Paul, which is it's a vintage. No one wanted them back in the day, you know. It's only because the other ones are going away. Or like a 70, 74. Well, you know what I mean? Like, so vintage is uh, no uh, indication of quality, is what I'm trying to say. But um, Yeah, so, when, I was, when I was growing up, it's like uh, used, used gear was all the cool stuff from the 70s. Uh -huh. Because this was in the 80s. Yeah, yeah. Like 10 years old. So yeah. now I shudder to think like used gear from ten years ago is is line six, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. line six. Yeah. I, I feel sorry for the people that have to go in the stores, and now it's just like a, oh look, I have a line six spider amp. Okay, yes, awesome. You know what? But dude, I used a line six. Uh, it was a Pod Pro. I yeah. used one for years. I used to put it through two. Yeah. It's, it's, it sounds like sacrilege now. I used to have a, a, a rack mount uh, line six Pod Pro, and I used to put it through two. JCM 800s. I used to put it through the effects loop, so I've got the power stage of the 800s. But now I'm thinking, why didn't I just put like the 800s, like two 800s? You know what I mean? Yeah, just but we, little, we, we were know. talking about this too at the time. You weren't you 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 were saying you weren't really into Marshalls at the time. 
I wasn't, no. Um, then, I was more uh, into that 6L6 type thing, you know. Yeah, and then and then over time you've learned to appreciate that it. It's true. Um, yeah, because I was always like, um, I, like the, the American sound was, yeah. was more kind of, I guess, I don't know if it was the, the Metallica connection or, or what it was. But um, it just responded a different way to me. But yeah, as, as I get older, there's more. There's a there's a voicing. I think I think I think what it is is like the older you get, the more mids you you put in. You know what I mean? And the more you can play with more mid. You know, when you're younger, the lack of mid, yeah, helps you. And so the the, the older you get, the gain goes down and the mid goes up. You know? What yeah, I mean? that's that's really that's yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because I think you, you know you like anything you get better hopefully and you get more of an understanding on the instrument and you can deal with those mids and don't need all that gain and you know but i was always into that type of thing but um but yeah i mean in the studio i think we we uh the main rhythm guitar sound was an old i'm talking about vintage and not really vintage it was an old 76 les paul custom um which is one of those, it was a good one. It's a good one. I've had it for years. I played it on stage. I played it on stage with Priest since I joined. Uh, it just seems to be one of those, a good one, a, a mid seventies, yeah. good one. Um, and it was through a, a JVM. I think it was a JVM on the, like Marshall JVM. Um, was it not the green channel? Is it the orange channel? That's kind of. Oh, I don't know. There's too many channels on them. <laughs> <laughs> that's what like four, four channels well, there's, there's like there's, isn't there like four channels and then there's an extra gain boost and, and like and there's I, three I, channels I, per channel there's like three modes per channel yeah 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 oh, yeah yeah right so but we tried some 800s we tried some pvs we tried some angles i think there was defender is it defender 50 50 50? 50? Yeah, yeah 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 we tried that um i think we might have used that as well i think we might have blended that in there yeah, I think um, I read something where that was part of the tone with someone. Was, See think, that that sound now that makes sense. Yeah, the fifty one, fifty three. Yeah. Yeah, I think it was. I think it was. Uh, I and I don't know if some stuff was reamped as well. So I might have recorded it, for example, with the JVM, and then it might have been re uh, reamped through the JVM. And I think the the, the Fender fifty one fifty was part of it. Um, I couldn't tell you where that went in. You know, in the balance of things. Um, but the main guitar was uh, was, a, was the Les Paul, um, and then for solos and stuff, I used everything I could. I used the uh, uh, I used you know the stuff I used. I used the Gibsons. I used the Epiphones. Um, the, the clean sounds was this, this old. Uh, as a new, uh, I went. I was in Amsterdam, and uh, have you heard of the? Is a pedal. I don't know who makes it. It's called the Miku, and it's like this Japanese voice simulator. So you play it, and it goes. Wah, 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 wah. Like, like that. Hopefully, no, no one saves that and makes a gif out of it. But um, <laughs> I'm, let me mark down the time right now. <laughs> <laughs> you should check it out. I mean, it's the most useless pedal, but it's the most fun pedal you'll ever you'll ever come across. If you put it on, everyone. So what happened was, long story short, I was in Amsterdam and I, I'd seen this pedal and I wanted to try it out. So I was trying it out through this. It was like a Telecaster with it was a black Telecaster. I think it's like a sixties reissue. It had like a binding um, rosewood neck, and I was playing this Miku pedal. And funny enough, there was like a crowd of people around it because the pedal was just hilarious. You've got to check it out. <laughs> but um, so I bought the Telecaster and the pedal, and the Telecaster ended up being the the, the main sound for all the clean guitars uh, on the record. Uh, it was the Telecaster through a. Uh, um, What's, it? What's the uh, 120? The um, the JC 120. The uh, oh, Yamaha. Like our, like, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, the JC 120, the Roland. Old That's what I was thinking, like, like a regular, like a jazz. The classic jazz rock, course. Yeah. Chris, yeah. Uh, clean tone, yeah. Yeah, yeah the we jazz tried, course right? is awesome. Yeah, and we, we tried different uh, different guitars. We tried. Glenn's got this beautiful old 61 Strat, you know. Uh, really chimey. We tried that through it, but the the one that came out on top was this Japanese um, 2015 Telecaster. That just had just the quality, you know, it had the bell, the chimey quality. But it, it's always the mids, and it? it's always the mids that really makes or breaks it, in my opinion. Um, and it had everything. 
So we use that for for most, if not all, the clean tones on the record. Um, and then from then it was spatterings of Les Pauls and Flying V's and Strats on the on the solo stuff, you know. Um, and that was pretty much it. And uh, it was pretty straightforward, but uh, just whatever sounded good. But for the lead stuff, I tried to get different things on there, you know, different um, guitars that I own just to have them on the record. And if, if they had a voice, yeah, to use it. Um, so yeah, that's 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 what we did really. Um, but again, it, just getting back to what I was saying, that the main rhythm channels on on the main stuff was just a seventy six Les Paul. Um, I think all the down tune stuff was actually the Epiphone. I had a prototype of the Epiphone at the time. I, I think it's this one. I don't know if you can see it. It's that one over there. They sent me that one. That that was the prototype for what became the signature model. Mm. Um, and I I took it over at the time. So any any of the drop tune stuff. I played on that one, um, so that made the record. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much it through Marshalls and PVs and uh, you know proper stuff. Very cool, very cool. We have a, another question here from Craig Guitar Wannabe. He said, uh, "Why do you prefer active pickups?" Um, that's a great question. I don't know if I prefer them. Um, they just seem to do the job that I want them to do at the moment. Um, I go through phases. There's a strat down there. I, I play single coils on the strats. You know, sing, single coils have got their have got their uses. You know, you know, if you if we were talking earlier on about fuzz, you know, if you if you put an active through a an active pickup through a fuzz, you, it it's doesn't, work. doesn't work. No, no you uh, pass. Yeah. yeah. Um, so everything's got their use. And at the moment, you know, with being priest, priest, I'm not really looking at doing anything. Other than that, really, as I said, they've, they've always given me uh, a voice and opinion. And, then, you know, I can only give that a thousand percent back. So my main focus at the moment is priest and priest music. And uh, so the, the actives, they, they work. They work really well for that. Um, I've, I've also got, you know, I, I've got a, um, an old Les Paul. I've got a 68 or a 69 Les Paul Custom that I use with priest every now and again. And that's got the passives in it. It's got the old T-tops in it. Sounds great, and I just leave it as it is. It needs a bit of bit more, excuse me, um, gain. Yeah, a bit more gain. So I leave the amp as it is. I just put like a, I think I've got like a little Mesa. Uh, they did like a range of, um, a range of pedals about two, three years ago. I can't remember which one it is, but it just just pushes the gain at the front end, and that's that's all it needs really. But the, the character's still there. So I don't know if I necessarily prefer them. They just seem to do the job that I, I want them to do at the moment. You know. Right. Gotcha, gotcha. And so what amps were you using live on the most recent leg of the tour? I've been using the uh, the Engel since I joined. Um, Glenn was using Engel. And uh, I was using PV at the time. Um, I had the 6505, I think it was. Oh, okay. But um, what it was, uh, I liked the, the 6505. On the, there's a clean channel and a rhythm channel on, on the same channel. Yeah, um, but you couldn't switch between the two no. independently. So I used to use the the uh, the rhythm channel, and it was great. But you couldn't. I needed a, de a dedicated clean channel, and it, it couldn't do that. Mm -hmm. um, and Glenn said, um, "Why don't you try the angles?" And I tried them, and uh, they did what I needed them to do. Really, ironically, again, as you know, as I said earlier on, when I get older. I, I used four channels when I uh, joined Priest. So I had a clean channel, a rhythm channel, and two lead channels. Mm. Now I just use a, uh, a rhythm channel, excuse, excuse me, and a, a rhythm channel and a, and a lead channel, and just roll the roll the pot down mm -hmm. on the rhythm channel for the cleans, really. So, um, but yeah, I'm still using the angles. Um, uh, I've used them ever since. I shouldn't say. I always say this. I shouldn't say it, but they've, they've never gone down. They've never they've never blown up. If anything's ever blown up. It's always been um, something in the loop, or like a like a dodgy circuit somewhere, somewhere else outside the amp. They've always been great in terms of reliability. So, and they, they do they do the job really. So, uh, you know, I've just kept them in there. Funny enough, uh, Zach Wildy, when we were on the on the as you said when you saw us um, in the, on the Epitaph tour, he used to come up every night and he loved the band and you know he used to check the band out. And uh, he said to me one night, he said, uh, "So you've got these two amps here." He said, that one's your main one, and that one's the spare. I said, yeah. And he said, uh, well, what happens if the spare goes down as well? 
And I said, I don't fucking know. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it never really crossed my mind until you said it. Thanks, Zach. So, so what would happen was, I remember that that tour. Like, um, we would be Zach would be on tour somewhere in the states, and I'd be somewhere in England, and uh, my phone would be going off at like four o'clock in the morning, oh, and yeah. uh, you know, friends of mine would be like, "Who the fuck's text? Who's texting you at four o'clock in the morning?" It's Zach. He's found a he's found a JCM 800 on on eBay and he's sending me it because it's a good deal because he wants me to have a spare for <laughs> the ring, you know. So it was quite funny, but um, but they've they've never gone down, so they've just stayed in there ever since. That's cool. I know the, the, the Powerballs is that what they are? It's the Powerball too. Yeah, it's the, it's the second Powerball, and I think Glenn uses the Invaders, but he's got some sort of mod that he uses. I think actually, if I'm not mistaken, I could be totally mistaken about this. Glenn has changed the power tubes. I think the Invader is an EL34 head, and he's changed them to 6L60s, or vice versa. I think it's something like that. So um, hopefully Glenn doesn't mind me giving away the Glenn Tipton secret. But I think that's what he's done. He's changed the power tubes in the Invader. Um, mm. And uh, I used the Powerball too, yeah. Nice. Well, tones are great. They really are. Um <laughs> Rocamp Ro Camp 56 says, Good evening, Mark, Dave, and Richie. What was Richie's hardest song to learn in Priest? It's a good question because it's not, it's not necessarily about notes and uh, you know what notes are hard to play. It's usually about the vibe um, and the, uh, the heart of the song that's the challenge to play. You know? they, they would never really... Uh, you know, like if you listen to Ingvo Malmsteen or um, Steve Vai or Joe Satriani, it's, you know, super shreddy stuff. It was never that. It was never super shreddy until you got into Painkiller, that sort of era. But it was always very nuanced, like Michael Schenker. Michael Schenker is a prime example. It was the way you play the notes. So it's always like Sinner, uh, Victim of Changes, um, those sort of songs where you can play the notes, but you've got to play the notes with the right heart, you know. So that's always that's always a challenge, and that's always something that you've got to, you know, the, these songs have been around for fifty years almost, some of them, you know. So um, you've got to represent them as much as you can. Not so, you know. Sometimes you play differently, and that's fine. But as long as I think you get across what's being said, the heart, as I said, the heart and what the solo means. That's what I try to do. So, so maybe the hardest ones were "Victim of Change," the big solos, you know, the big KK Downing solos, "Victim of Changes." The Sinner uh, and stuff like that for sure. Awesome. Um, we've got another question from Judas Priest Defender. Says, would love to hear what Richie has learned or how he's grown from playing Glenn's solos. That's a great question. That's a great question. I think about that all the time, you know, because like it's funny how you get um, your style changes based on who you listen to. And, um, you know, the, the, you know, recently in Priest, um, I've been taking a lot more of Glenn solos, you know, and there's a lot more um, sweet picking type stuff, uh, a lot more stretch playing, which I didn't ordinarily do. Um, and it's great because that's what you're supposed to do as a player. You always find someone, whether whether you're playing the stuff live or whether you just get turned on to someone musically that does something different. Um, they do something different than you do, and you, you want to know what that is and incorporate that into your playing. So I think definitely, like, Painkiller, we've had, a, as I said earlier on, we've had to go through all guns blazing uh, at, at rehearsals. We might drag that out at the, at the, on the next tour. Um, it's, it's stylistically different than what I'd usually do. So it definitely stretches you as a player. Um, it definitely makes you think differently. And Glenn... Not only the sweet picking and the arpeggios and the tapping and stuff, not only that, but it's the note choice that Glenn uses as well is very unorthodox. And um, it really makes you think like he was very aware that he was trying to create something different, uh, something unique. Um, so all of that you try and take on board. But so it definitely, without a doubt, has had a, an effect on my playing. Um, and, you know, when you sit down, you get the guitar and you sit down and just have a little noodle around, you see those things start to come forward when you're noodling around. Those those shapes or those techniques 
Mm-hmm. Um, so it's funny how it's funny how um, those players like Glenn not only listening to him on, on CD or records or vinyl, whatever it may be, but now because of what's happened in, in the band and Glenn's had to take a back seat, playing a bit more of Glenn's stuff, it starts to infiltrate your own style, you know. So, you know, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. He's, he's one of the great guitar players of our generation. So, uh, you know, the more I can learn from Glenn and other people like that, the better. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. That's a, that's a great education. Right. Without a doubt, without a doubt. And it's an, again, you said that word earlier on, it's an, it's an organic one, you know, it's not like, well, I'm going to try and do this, you know, because this guy sounds great. It's it's a, it's more of an organic thing. It's more sort of, you know, Glenn's still in the band and you're, you're taking that role mm-hmm. in some of these solos and it kind of uh, becomes part of your style organically. You're not trying to copy anyone. You're just trying to do someone in the fans, really. That's what they're used to listening to. That's what they've grown up with. And, uh, and you're trying to do Glenn justice. You're trying to make him proud and the fans happy. And uh, and then it becomes part of your style organically, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, Dave, I've got another question here, but I just before I go, I was going to see if you had anything. Uh, so Rob Peters asks, how long uh, does Andy Snead plan on filling in for Glenn? And will Priest be holding audition for a Glenn replacement? It's, it's a good question. I mean, Andy's always been great. He's always said, as long as we need him, he'll be there, you know, and he's obviously put, he's a producer first and foremost, and he's put, he's put off work to make way for this. So we can only thank him for that, you know, um, but I mean, as long as, and as long as, and as long as we need him, Andy said, he's going to be there. Yeah, um, great. You know, um, as far as beyond that, we don't really know. We haven't really given it much thought. Um, but that's that's really the answer, really. As long as we need him, Andy said he'll be there. So, and then we'll see what happens in the future. Yeah, I mean, he, he might turn around one day and say to us, "He's got some. He's he's too busy this year. He can't do it." And yeah, in that yeah. in, that, in that case, we'll be uh, calling you up, Dave, and saying, "You know, strap on your strap on yeah, your." Yeah, no, not me. <laughs> <laughs> but I might know some. Uh, <laughs> that's, um, that's cool. That's awesome. Um, well, I had a question. Just, just getting back to that point, just quickly. You know, as as we said before, there's there's millions of guitar players, and sometimes it's it's more about that. You know, I, I think it's uh, it's more than just about playing guitar, and uh, it's one of the reasons Andy's up there at the moment. You know, we could trust him. He's a great guy. He's part of the family. He had a history with us, and he's a good enough guitar player. He's a great guitar player. Uh, you know, so it's it's you get some people out there that concentrate purely on the guitar. But it's more it's more than that. I think if we do get anyone, it's it's going to be the same sort of situation. It's going to be someone that's uh, a great guy, a great team player, a great guitar player. Um, you someone know, you some, can along with someone you can hang on the bus with, someone you can go to dinner with. Yeah, yeah. exactly. There's millions of guitar players, but there's a million idiots as well. You know what I mean? So you've yeah. got to be able to get along with them, and that's the main thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Absolutely. that's key. That's a key thing. Um, I, I was curious if you, you know, we went through your, your career as far as history and influences and how you, what, you know, bands and how, what led you to Judas Priest. Can you tell us about some of the, your favorite gear over the years, like your fav- first guitar and some of your favorite gear? I'd love to hear about that. It's a great question. Um, well, my first guitar was, it, it was like a Strat copy. It was, um, I think it was Sun. Sun used to make, you know, Sun like they, they made amplifiers like yeah, Sun amps, yeah, yeah, and they made like a like a Strat copy, huh. and uh, that was my first, you know, real guitar. It looked like a Strat. It looked like Jimmy's guitar, you know. He had like a big Strat headstock and stuff. Um, so that was my first uh, real guitar, so to speak. I know it was like a cheap thing, but I got like a, I think I was maybe eight or nine. Got it for Christmas and a little practice sample or whatever. I played it for days, you know. Mm-hmm. But um, I, and then I think the one after that was an Epiphone Flying V. Funny enough, I've got it in the, the. I've got a spare room over there. I've got it in there. I've still got it. Oh wow, uh, that's awesome. Yeah, it's um, and it, and it was a. I think it's like a an eighties. I don't know when it was from, but it was like a perloid white thing, and it had like an Explorer headstock. It's, I don't know if you know the one I mean, but uh, it had like a Seymour Duncan Invader in it and um, some other uh, passive in it. Mm. Um, and I used to come home from school every night 
and played like there was a, a Maiden uh, album called Live After Death, and you could split like left and right. You had one guitar player on one side, you had Davey Murray on one side and Adrian Smith the other. So I'd learn Davey Murray's parts and then turn him off, and then you could play the whole gig, uh, <laughs> you, you know, and play along with yeah. Adrian Smith in the band. Yeah. You know, so I did that every night. I used to love it, and you know. I, I learned a lot on that guitar. Um, you know, I guess like the early, that was maybe before I was playing in, in gigs. Um, and you learn sort of when to play rhythm, when to play lead, when to, mm-hmm. when to stop, when to start, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, so that was, that was my main guitar for, for a few years. Then I got into, but it's ironic, really. It's a coincidence in a way that, you know, the signature guitar was a, an Epiphone Flying V and that was my first real serious guitar that, um, that's cool. So, kind, know, of makes, kind of makes more sense even now. Yeah. It definitely does. Yeah. I mean, people say, you know, you know, why do you play a flying V? You always played Les Pauls. Well, I did I primarily play Les Pauls. Still do. Um, but the flying V has always been a part of my arsenal. I mean, there was Schenker, there was Randy Rhodes, it was Hetfield, it was, you know. Mm-hmm. I think the first flying V I actually saw was on a cover of a Shalimar uh, seven inch single, which has nothing to do with rock or heavy metal. There's like it's a Shalimar. Uh, I Can Make You Feel Good, I think was the name of the single. And it was a guy with an afro and he had a Dean flying V. I just remember thinking it was the coolest thing ever. But Shalimar, oh, that's so funny, yeah. Remember, Shalimar, yeah, yeah. I remember the band, yeah. yeah. The flying V. Song, too. <laughs> yeah. Well, by and, the um, yeah, well, I, I, just, I just have to show my flying V to just... Yeah. Again, it's exactly. Randy Rhodes. Yeah, Randy Rhodes. I mean, um, who else had a V? Uh, as I said, Schenker, Ken, obviously, KK Downing. Um, you know, there's many... Many players have played one. Kirk Hammett, James Hetfield. I was, I was big into a V. Um, so, uh, so as I said, subsequent, subsequently got into the the, the Les Paul. But I've, a V has always been part of my arsenal. So that and, uh, ep- that Epiphone V that you had, um, that's the one with the pointy headstock. Yeah, it's got like a yeah um, uh, explorer shaped headstock. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know exactly what yeah. you're talking about. Yeah. That's yeah. cool. It's a bolt on neck and uh, it's got a, like a Kayla, I think. I don't know if it's a Kayla. Kayla or Floyd Rose. Um, so again, it's always been part of the the musical makeup, you know, to have a uh, a whammy bar, <laughs> as you guys yeah. say. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, but uh, as, as far as, as, aside from that, as far as amps, um, I was never into the martial stuff, as you said earlier on, until recently. But I was always... Um, it was funny. I think playing in in bars and stuff, you just look for the the most versatility that you could get, really. So it was the, the line six thing we spoke about earlier on had the, all the effects in it. So I didn't need to go and get a delay pedal. I didn't need to get a flanger. I didn't need to get a wab. It was all in there, mm-hmm. and I just put that through a couple of eight hundreds uh, and went from there. But uh, you know, I, I had a boogie. I, I had this, this boogie preamp thing. Uh, I loved, 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 loved. It was a boogie preamp and a uh, two 100 power amp. I, I'd always get complaints from people, you know, sound men told me to turn it down and, you know, it was too loud, the thing, but it was, <coughs> loved, loved the boogie stuff. Again, that American, um, that American power stage I was always into. Mm. But uh, apart from that, it was always a Les Paul and some sort of, it wasn't, that was all it was really. It wasn't anything too complicated. Um, any pedals, any things that you that you liked back then? Not really. It was always like the, the standard Jim Dunlop crybaby, mm-hmm. um, a chorus, a delay, and a tuner. That was pretty much it. You know, if you had that, you could pretty much get through anything. I remember uh, I'd done a gig once and we were doing a cover gig and, you know, we are doing Sweet Child of Mine. So I had my Les Paul, I had my amplifier, the wah pedal, delay, it was rocking. It was coming up, you know, and uh, you know. So we would do Guns N' Roses songs, and uh, something went wrong with the amplifier. So I, I had to go through the PA, and then so and then something went wrong with the power supply on the pedals. So I had no pedals, oh, and the guitar as well. So something I broke a string on the guitar. So I was playing a Strat oh. through a dry PA. It, Sweet Child of Mine. So there was no wire pedal. There was oh, no God. distortion. Dude, it was. Awful, oh, oh <laughs> but you know it's one of them things that you, you there's no getting out of it. You've got to do it. You've got to stand up there, and you've got to. You, See, that's you, where that Zach Wild comment you should have had it earlier about the backup, <laughs> about the backup amp. Yeah, true. Yeah. True. <laughs> he, he, 
But um, you get through it, I suppose, and um, it teaches you to not rely on power supplies. I've ne- I've always used batteries ever since then. Mm. Um, always have a backup. But um, but it was but you get through it. And somehow people just want a bit of songs, you know. They, they were drunk out their minds anyway. It's an, an Irish bar somewhere in West London, and uh, we got through it. But at that time, it was like that's your life. That's what you do. That's mm-hmm. your, the culmination of everything you stand for has gone into that guitar solo, and now you're playing the wrong guitar through a PA. With no pedal, I do it. It was, it was awful, <laughs> but you know, but you, you get through it somehow. No one cared. No one cared. Everyone loved it. So uh, you know, that's there's awesome. a, there's, a, there's a moral. There's a story there. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. At the end of the day, it's about the music, right? <laughs> exactly. That. Yeah. 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 Um, here's a question from Richard Henry. He said, "Question for Richie: If the Aussie dates don't happen, does he think Priest will play a UK tour?" I'm gutted. Dublin was cancelled. Yeah, we all were, and we, we know that um, a lot of people, you know, flew into Dublin, a lot of people had hotels in Dublin. Uh, it wasn't just a gig that, that they had a ticket for, you know, it was a lot more than that, you know. I mean, um, hopefully they get uh, rescheduled and, and they go ahead, but, you know, the way these things work, you know, the, the tour gets bought as a package, so... Um, it gets bought with Ozzy Osbourne and Judas Priest support. So, and it's just usually uh, some restrictions around that. So you can't, you know, they, they've bought uh, the package. Um, so, for example, you can't play in uh, Wembley, for example. You can't play anywhere in the vicinity within a certain amount of time or a certain radius because that detracts now from the promoter's earning power. It all gets into this sort of crap really that no one really thinks about but it plays a part at the end of the day um but we, we you know if these don't happen we, we have to get to the uk at some point if, if aussie for some reason or another can't can't do it or he's not well enough to do it mm-hmm. the uk is where the band's from um you know we can't forget the uk we'd have to come back to the to the uk and do some firepower dates um so yeah i mean that's, that's the answer really if aussie can't do it we'd have to get back to the uk at some point without a doubt Cool, cool. Uh, Dave, any questions on your end? I- I've got, I've got one, but it's up to you. Uh, go for it. Uh, Brian McKenzie, Richie, are there other genres of music that you like to play? Um, yeah, I mean, anything really, you know, not just heavy metal, but hard rock and some blues. Um, <clears throat> that that sort of that's the main thing, really. I'm not really a jazz guy. I don't really, you know, it's obviously guitar oriented music, which is, you know, uh, hard rock, heavy metal, not really so much jazz. Um, But anything on that sort of spectrum. um, I love blues. I love like modern blues, you know, stuff uh, Bonamassa is doing and Jared James Nichols are doing and, you know, that that sort of stuff. Um, There seems to be a lot of it around at the moment as well. Um, uh, Tyler Bryant as well, you know, it seems, seems to be like a, a blues uh, revival going on, you know, mm. uh, from a guitar player point of view, there's a lot of it going on. So um, I always thought Bonamassa did it slightly different. He, he always did it in more of an Eric Johnson sort of mm-hmm. uh, style. Um, so, yeah, I like that sort of stuff. But it's all guitar-oriented stuff, um, but mainly hard rock, blues, heavy metal. Um, it's interesting as well, like, you know, I listened a lot to, uh, you know, like some early 80s, mid 80s sort of pop synthy type stuff. And some of the stuff that those guys are doing chord wise, you know, you've got like the police, mm. uh, um, Andy Timmons, um, Flock of Seagulls, uh, some of the chord work that those guys are doing is really interesting type stuff, you know, JC120 type stuff. Um, I like that sort of stuff as well. It's, it's kind of interesting, but mainly that kind of, that's the heart of it, really. That's cool. You know, one one uh, band that you didn't mention or guitar player that you didn't mention, I'm just curious your thoughts on it and what impact it was on, was Van Halen. I missed it. I missed the Van Halen thing until later on. Um, so, I mean... Yeah, so you're about 10 years younger than I am. So, yeah, I'm 39. Yeah. Or, so you're 11 years younger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, same, same, same exact. Yeah, 11 years younger. So um, yes, you would have missed that entirely. 
just missed it. So I came into it like a lot of things, really. I mean, I mean, Hendrix, I missed it. Obviously, I wasn't alive. So um, the Van Halen thing I got into later, um, I was always, do you know what I loved about Van Halen was the blue stuff, the bends, the the phrasing. Everyone that plays Van Halen plays the tapping and the, 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 that sort of stuff. But Van Halen has got a really unique voice when it comes to bends mm -hmm. and phrasing and just note choice you know that sort of that stuff that makes you go oh that's tasty you know plus he had all the all, obviously all the tapping stuff but um and an interesting swing too to everything oh yeah. and that's where people and that's where people try that try to play it get it wrong they don't capture his feel totally and the rhythms and, well rhythms. and his feel with his brother on drums right so that there's a there's a symbiotic relationship that they have together that thousand percent pretty crazy Thousand percent. I mean, I love him now. I mean, totally. I mean, rev totally. In my opinion, revolutionised the guitar at that time. You know, before that, it was you know it was Hendrix in the in the late sixties. I don't think anyone really done it the same way until Van Halen came along. You know, looking back at it, um, again, it was it was before my time really, before I was aware of it. But uh, looking back on it now, I mean, no one's really revolutionised it before Van Halen, in my opinion, since he came along. It just Again, not only the tapping, but the, uh, as you said, like the, the groove, the timing, yep. the, the, the whole package. The aggression the, on, on the early stuff, the aggression. Yeah, yeah the writing, so, just the writing. Attitude. Yeah. Songs. And, you know, in, he'd come out and do a guitar solo, and it wasn't always blazing. Sometimes he'd roll it back on a guitar and just do some nice sort of delay pieces or some chord type work, you know, like Brian May used to do. You know, it wasn't. It wasn't always a million miles an hour, um, which sort of I heard other people playing it, and it kind of turned me off a little bit. But when I actually li listened to him, it was a lot more than that, um, and a lot more, a lot more interesting, a lot more feel, a lot more blues based, and just just a phenomenal player without a doubt. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Um, first of all, I want to be respectful of your time. How are you on time? I know we're almost approaching two hours. So, I'm good. I've got about a quarter of a bottle left. So uh, I've okay. got about a quarter. If, we j if that's a time scale, I've got about well that much left. So <laughs> that should I'm be at least, at least a 45 minutes. So okay. <laughs> well, then you have to you have to hold it up when it's empty. That's a kind of a tradition here <laughs> you know, on the show. Uh, I'll let you know. Yeah, I'm 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 doing those if people can see. You're too so, deep. Ooh. Too, too deep. Well, oh, I know. All right, Dave. I'm a lightweight. You know that. So. <laughs> Um, so we have another question from Deja Blue. He said, uh, Richie, ever get to play Glenn or Ken's guitars, favorite in their collection? I think that's a kind of a unique question, so I was kind of interested. It's a great question. Um, I've never played Ken's guitars. I've, I've never, obviously never spoke to Ken, never had any dealings with him, and his guitars aren't really lying around in the studio or anything like that. But Glenn, definitely. I mean, there's, there's uh, been some times when, you know, we have a warm-up room backstage and our guitars are set up and we've got these little practice amps or whatever. So every now and then I'll sort of sneak in and pick up Glenn's guitars and play. But they're totally different to what I'd, I'd normally play. Like the, the the necks are different, the setup's different, the strings, everything's totally different to what I'd used to play. But um, the guitars that he uses on stage are those legendary ones that he's always used, the Hamers, the mm -hmm. Phantoms, the GTs. He's got a beautiful old um, 70s Strat that uh, he's got in the studio that me and Andy were fanboying about. Um, he's, I think it's on uh, the cover, if I'm not mistaken, of Unleashed in the East, and it's a black strat, and it's got two double white um, passives. I don't know what they are. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I don't know if they're DiMarzio or Seymour Duncan or whatever. There's two cream humbuckers in this black strat, and it's got like a mirror scratch plate. And if, anyone would know it. it's got a it's probably a 70s. It's got like a, a large headstock and it weighs a ton, you know. Oh, it's an ash body. It's an ash body strat then. A northern yeah. ash. It, it, yeah, you pick it up and you're like, ah. Oh. Yeah, yeah. If, if you've got oh, a boat. Crap. It's and, heavier than a Les Paul. Exactly. If you've got a ship and you're out on the, the open seas and you can't find your anchor. Anchor, yeah. <laughs> your anchor. Throw that. Yeah, yeah. Um, or as a paddle, one or the other. A paddle. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, your arms would get too tired to use that's it as a paddle. That's, that's true. Too heavy. It's yeah. true. It's a heavy thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so there's that one that's beautiful. There's an old 61. He told me a great story once. He said that he had a, 
a salmon pink Fender Stratocaster, like an original, uh, I guess it would have been an early 60s um, salmon pink. He had a 61 SG uh, and uh, a Les Paul, like a Les Paul Custom. It was like a 54 or something. And um, he had them in front of his, it was during the days where they had them on stands in front of the stacks, you know, so mm -hmm. it was like, uh, and he, something happened where he, he pulled the stack down on the three of them and snapped the headstocks on them, all three oh, of them. No. Yeah, so I mean, there were some classic guitars there, you know, like proper custom colors and proper, mm. proper na uh, 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 years, you know, like the, as I said, the 54 Les Paul, whatever, smashed them all, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Took, they never put the stands in front of those again, did they? No, exactly that, no, no. But, um, oh. <laughs> But Glenn, Glenn's, um, Glenn is, um, he's always said to me, you know, he's, he always sees guitars as tools. He's never seen them as, uh, he's never got that romantic about them, you know. Uh, he's got a guitar that does the job and he uses that as a tool. And as a result, he's never really had like a vast collection of classic instruments. He just has the instruments that do the job for him and that's it really. He's, he's never really had that uh, relationship with them. Which is interesting, you know. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, there was another question that I wanted to get to. Um, someone had asked, um, "How is Glenn feeling?" Oh, that was uh, Craig Guitar Wannabe. How's Glenn feeling these days? He's feeling okay. I mean, that knows the nature of the disease. Uh, no. <laughs> Uh, a degenerative disease, you know, so it's never gonna, you know, it's never gonna go uphill, you know, unfortunately. unfortunately. But um, yeah. but there are things that, you know, there are steps you can take to slow it down and kind of get on top of it. Um, it's a very, I think, as far as my understanding of it, it's a very uh, personal disease in the sense that it affects sufferers differently. You know, so you need to take different medications based on your, your body chemistry. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this amount of medication for one person might be totally different to someone else, and you've got to get that routine right. And um, but I think you know he's he's doing okay considering the challenges that he's facing. He's he's still upbeat. He's still mentally with us, and you know he, he wants to contribute uh, to the next record if we do one. Uh, awesome. He's full of ideas. Yeah, he's always full of ideas. He, he's always full of ideas creatively and. Um, and otherwise, so um, I'm actually going to see him. What's the date today? I'm actually going to see him in a couple of weeks. So um, before we start rehearsals for the next uh, next go round. So uh, hopefully we'll see him on the next go round. Um, yeah. We've always said to the fans, if he can make it, he'll be there. If he can't, everyone knows why. Um, and I tell you what, man. Sometimes when he comes out and he surprises the fans, it's just you know it's, a, it's like a tear in the eye moment. You know what I mean? Not only because it's him, but what it represents, you know, it's going through what he's going through, uh, to stand up to those challenges mm -hmm. in the way that he does it in front of 10,000 people, 5,000 people, or, you know, to stand up and do that. It's, it's massive. You yeah, know what I mean? Perseverance. Yeah, that's, who yeah. that's who he is, man. He's, he's a hero. So, uh, yeah. it, it's an inspiration to us all without a doubt. Yeah. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. I hope, I hope he stays well. That's, uh, that's the most important thing. Um, oh, thanks, guys. Yeah, um, we have uh, from D Tune Man sixty seven. He says, "Any plans to expand or offer different versions of the signature V, for example, white?" <laughs> well, you're quite um, a fan of white, aren't you? Yeah, you know, yeah, don't you have a few amps in white? Yeah, I, I'm addicted to to white amps at the moment. Um, <laughs> I've, I don't know what it was. The white V, the white strap. The white Les Paul, I don't know what it is, you know, like the white, they sound better. I don't know what it is. <laughs> white um, sounds better. Yeah. yeah, for some reason, you yeah, know. I, I'll attest to that. There you go, Rick. Rick. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I can attest to that, too. <laughs> I think I want to write. There you there go. You go. White there. So. there you go. Beautiful. Funny enough, uh, uh, Mark, I don't know if you know, I just got the, uh, is that the, the, um, uh, the BE50 Deluxe? No, that's the B one hundred. Uh, that's a. Uh, that's the B one hundred. Yeah. Okay. Well, I got the fifty deluxe, and I just got the. the I got that same uh, in white, and um, I got the the pink taco, in white as well. Have you have you ever thought about making a hot pink, pink taco? 
Can you yes, get in, in fact, I did one a million years ago, but another guy is making one right. I'm making one for right now. That's really? Nice. Yeah. Dude, I'll tell you what, you know. Make two? I, make two. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, when I'm at home, you know, I've got the act room, I've got, you know, the Marshalls and whatever, you know, the original white ones. The only thing I ever play is this fucking pink tack that's over there. It's the only thing right. I ever play. Right. Home, you know, so we could do a hot pink one. That would be amazing. Well, but, did um, you see, did you ever see, I did a uh, hot pink BE100 head for Steve Stevens? <laughs> yes. it, wait, it's a hot pink head. With uh, uh, white control panels, clear knobs, clear knobs on it with uh, like a maybe off white handle or something, and a matching cabinet with original, uh, the original blues breaker cloth, like the old Marshall. Yeah, yeah. Really old stuff. You can, there's one guy that makes some reproduction that's perfectly like the original. Uh It's really expensive and stupid. (laughs) It's super expensive. (laughs) But um, it sure does look nice. And when he got that amp, it just like you looked at it and you were like, you laughed first, and then you're like, but it's cool. Yeah, it's like super cool. Yeah. <laughs> and, and he's like, I just like the fact that such a a loud, aggressive, mean amp is coming out of that. <laughs> you know, it's pretty ballsy. It's yeah. Pretty yeah, ballsy he's thing. Yeah. Huns on stage. <laughs> well, he's a killer player as well. You know what I mean? Like again, like heart, like a lot of all of all of this is getting up there and owning it. You know, so you, if you play a pink amp and get up there and own it, like Steve does, mm. you know what I mean? You can get away with it. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, absolutely. But yeah, the the the, the white. I don't know why. Like I've just got. The, I've just bought this. Uh, it's a 1979 JMP that I'm picking up in Atlanta when we we go through there. And there's another white. JCM 800 that I've just bought in Canada that I'm picking up when we go through there. I don't know what it is, you know. You might have a problem, maybe. I might do, I might do. I, I think <laughs> what it is as well, I've always been like a guitar guy, so I've always been collecting guitars and things like But like, after a point, you, you get, you, you know, what else can you buy guitar-wise? So I've kind of shifted on the amplifiers. Yeah, um, I, I have so that yeah. problem. I, yes. Uh, yeah. I'm, uh, par- I'm part, part of that group. Part. I, yeah, yeah. So I, <laughs> it's like this is almost like an AA meeting. Yeah. <laughs> it's like I have but that I problem. Love guys like you. <laughs> yeah, I, I know you of do. Course. <laughs> of course, of course. Is, have... you know, is the taco you're talking about the one the alligator white one? No, I, I bought this. Uh, it's the... But didn't you buy that too? I did. Yeah, the white alligator one. Yes, yeah, in the other room. Yeah, and the then this... edition. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, and it's got something. It's got like a different voice. It's like switches on it and stuff. But the, yeah, the yeah. Uh, the one that I always play is just uh, the original. Uh, okay, one. yeah. It's just the original uh, yeah. twenty watt taco. It's just wicked. It's just great fun. It's got you know you can roll it back to like um, like nine o'clock, and you've got some great sort of cleanish tones, and then you can dial it in mm-hmm. and, and do some shredding on it. It's just great fun. It, it's, I yeah. think that's that's what it is. It's, Sounds it's great, fun. really low and and yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I, I also have I have the Wildwood Pink Taco, although mine's in red, and Killer. now that you said in pink, pink would would sound pretty would would sound even better. Yeah, Shit, gotta I do agree. it. Gotta do it. Hot pink. You could do a hot pink taco, man, without a doubt. Yeah. All I, right. And ironically, you're gonna get a phone call. You know that, right? <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna be like, hey, uh, guess what? Here's a picture. Snap. It's done. <laughs> Here's um, my address. Didn't, didn't <laughs> Steve Stevens play the uh, pink that pink? be on uh american idol also yes he did yeah that was with for- with some yeah. singer uh, uh yeah that with, that did a billy idol song and it, it the guitar tech was telling me it was kind of funny it's like they wanted to cover it all up and put it in the back and 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 he's like no that's like the centerpiece so they literally put it right next to it right up in front with the singer right next to it yeah and it's just like standing there going hello <laughs> Yeah, it was. As it should it be. Was, What's that? As, as it should be. You yeah. Know, the hot pink amplifier should be front and center, you know? <laughs> yeah, it stood out. It definitely stood out. Um, I had a question for you, Richie. Um, what's what, what's the writing process like? And, um, you know, for new material or, you know, even for firepower, how did you guys go about the process of writing and, you know, working with Rob, you know, and, you um, how's that all work? I'm just curious. Does, you know, does the music first and he comes in and does the lyrics later or, you know, does he come in with an idea? I'm just curious how that all works. 
It's a bit of both, really, but I'd say uh, primarily it's music first. We usually, you know, I mean, I, I, I've only done two records, so I can only speak from two mm-hmm. two cycles. But, um, you know, we'd come off the road um, and I'd usually write ideas on the road, and you know, little riffs, ideas, melodies, whatever on the road. You know, we can do that now with, you know, phones and little recording setups and stuff so um and then we'd go into our own spaces we'd go home we'd decompress we'd you know relax a little bit and then we'd put down some ideas in our own time on our own um and then we'd get together and kind of you know like the three of us are doing and say you know mark what do you got dave what do you got well i've got this idea let's listen to your riffs this is my ideas so it'll be me glenn and rob doing basically that and um and it's great because sometimes you'd hear something in someone else's riff that they think is okay, but and then someone else would hear something else in it, mm-hmm. or Rob would hear something and put a vocal on it, and it, it goes from being okay to epic. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, it's having that input of other people. Um, so we, we'd basically do that. And so, and then Rob would also come in, and it's funny, you know, before the last record, I'd get a text off Rob, and it'd be a voice voice file um, and it would be Rob singing or um, like phrasing like scatting into into the into the phone and he'd send me it so sometimes it would be a melody sometimes it would be a phrase or a rhythm um, you know what I mean so sometimes it might not be idea or melody but you could hear there was a there was a rhythm in there or a sweat or you could hear the vibe of it straight away so and then you can go away and put chords to that. And then when you get together with Glenn, we can embellish that idea. And then sometimes we'd be in there in the, in the studio in the writing session and Rob would come in. And I remember one, one time he came in and he'd been in a, in a traffic jam for two, two hours. And in the traffic jam, he'd come up with a, an idea um, and he'd put it on his phone and then he came into the session. And I had something just that would go with that. It was like an ACDC type riff like a devil's child type riff and it fit with the vocal and then we, we, we uh, gave birth to a song out of it so it happens in different ways really but primarily i'd say we'd we'd work out the music or at least the core of the song so we'd have like a an intro or a chorus or a but something that an identity so the song's got an, it's not finished but there's an identity there you can hear the vibe you can hear whether it's like a what type of song it is and rob will be sitting there soaking all this in mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, he, and he's got lyrics he's got song titles he's got concepts so when we've got some kind of idea where this song's going it's got this feel it sounds like this it's a fast song or whatever it may be what about this title Oh, that, that sounds great. That that suits the song totally. And then uh, he'll throw out a few melodies, and um, some of them. I mean, some of uh, some of them are just. I've got some of them on my phone. You know, um, he just comes. Uh, it's that thing uh, that um, you know when you do something for the first time. As I said earlier on with with Scott and Ian, when you do something without thinking about it. You do something based on the emotion you're getting from the music. Mm-hmm. And it comes out in a way that you'd never catch again, right? And luckily these days we can capture it for the first time. But like, there's something that happens. You do it the first time, you can never recreate it. You can never better it. And you end up going back to that take and, and using that one, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, because of the, I guess it's the, you're not thinking about it. You're, you're expressing the feeling and the emotion without getting too hippie about it. But that's kind of what it is. It's you. I guess he hears something and expresses the vocal melody, and it's just magic, you know. So um, a lot of the time it happens like that, and then a lot of times as well we have to sit down and work it out and what works there. Can we do a better one? And you know. Um, so it's a process, you know, but it's, it's one that's really, especially with the producers that we had this time around as well, 
it's a really freeing process. We were enabled to concentrate on those things rather than getting the, the sounds. Those guys could do that. Let's concentrate on getting the right uh, melodies, right performances, the right, you know, the right songs. And you, you always hope that you've, you've done that. You know, you, when you sign off on it, you, you've got to feel like you've got it. That's the best you can do. Otherwise, there's no point in mm-hmm. in, in releasing it. You know, and and uh, and you never know what you've got either. You never know if it's going to connect, if people are going to like it. But you've got to be kind of satisfied with the fact that you've done the best you can do. This is this is what we want to release, and we stand behind this. And and this record seems to really, you know, we've been playing in North America. This is the third time we've been back now. Mm-hmm. Uh, Asia, South America, Europe. Uh, Australasia, you know, all those sort of places. And it seems to really be connecting with people. And, uh, you know, we can only thank the fans, really, for sticking with the band for 50 years and um, and getting the record and, and putting it on and, and getting behind it, you know. As I said, you never know. Some of the best, some of the worst records in history have been the best ideas at the time, <laughs> you know. And for some reason, they haven't connected, haven't gone down well or whatever it is, but... You know, the, the intent was the same. The intent was always to do the best that they could possibly do. For some reason, they didn't connect. This one seems to be connected. So, uh, you know, we. And not only is it great for Priest and for us and the fans, but it's great for for heavy music as well. You know, in 2019, I think Firepower, although it didn't win a Grammy, yeah. it, it made it made a few ripples. It made a few uh, it made a few top tens. You know, it made a few number ones and. Heavy metal was up there. I think it was our, it was the band's highest chart in position on Billboard. I think it was number five on the Billboard charts, mm. which is the high, highest position they'd had. And I think that's that's uh, an affirmation of how strong heavy metal is and the love for heavy metal is in 2018, 19. Mm. So uh, that's that's the bigger picture. Not only is it we we love it when the fans love what we do and we we're proud to be out there flying the flag. But it's a bigger picture, to, you know. Um, to have a, a heavy metal record, top five, alongside rap and country and hip hop and all that other stuff, mm-hmm. is, is, a, is a big statement. We can't do that. The fans do that. The fans put it there. So, um, so it's a thank you to them, really. Well, that's amazing. I mean, that's a great attitude. Um, but it's also because it's a great product. Um, and uh, I mean, appreciate it. Yeah, it just sounds. I mean. To me, I Dave knows I've been ta- I've been ra- ranting about this album for like a year now, um, or however long it's come out. I've just been saying that. Uh, who, who, some, there was a question from one of the the re, one of the, the viewers recently. They were like, "What's uh, what's your favorite you know newer metal album?" And I was like, "The Judas Priest Fire Firepower album." <laughs> and and they're like, "No, new metal." Like you know, like the, the <laughs> and I'm like, "No, no, no, no. I'm st- I'm still stuck. No. I'm, I'm still stuck in that genre. That's." That to me is a killer album, and I was blown away by it. Um, yeah, it, it's just an amazing album. I don't know, Dave. Sorry to interrupt you. No, 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 no. You didn't interrupt me. I, I agree everything you just said. I, I think the album was fantastic. Yeah. It's interesting which, as well. It's so know. nice to hear at this point in time because I think often um, older bands that we grew up with and stuff, to, you know, seem to have lost. Um, Hmm. How do I want to say this? The spark, so, uh, so, sort of over the years, and it, it, it's like that new music out of them doesn't quite seem um, like it did. And this this record, you know, ranks up there with any of them. I appreciate it. I mean, yeah. I, I, would, I would. I mean, a question for you guys: How much do you think? It, you know, when when you say that, I saw Kiss a couple of weeks ago at the Garden. And I'm trying to work out how much of that is that spark, how much of that is uh, because of the bands, and how much of that is due to the audience that are consuming it. I can't work out, you know, if if the bands have changed or the audience would accept the change, even if it did have that spark. I, I can't work out if they if they would. Some people, myself included, seem to be, you know, this is the Metallica album, you know. Master of Puppets is the one, and they have never sounded like that since. But I don't know if... Uh, ride the lightning for me. Well, there you go. Right? Yeah. 
But, you know, and since then, they've never had that whatever it was again. But I don't know if it's us as an audience that isn't open to that or if we're just shutting it down, you know. Uh, uh, well, hmm. good question. I mean, I've listened to other Priest albums. Um, and for, some, you know, I mean, you know, clearly I'm wearing a British Steel uh, shirt, you know. Um, but... You know, there have been other Priest albums that didn't connect with me as much. But mm. this album, for whatever reason, like I have listened to songs off of this album and I'm like, this could be a hit in the 80s. It could be a hit now. It could, you know, it's just a timeless, freaking great song. And there were just things that about that album that just, that just connected with me where I was just like, the everything is connecting on this album. Like all the... I think it's the... I think it still comes back to the, the production team mm -hmm. and how uh, they managed to make it classic yet modern that fits yeah. in. mm. fits in today, but doesn't take away from what the heritage of priest. That's, that's my, my yeah, take. Fair point. Fair point. Yeah, yeah. 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 No, it's great. Great. You know, you mentioned um, blues players before and, um, so we had a question from Scott Short, uh, and he was he said, uh, Richie Faulkner, first off, very excited to see you play in Chicago on May 27th. And he said, who's your favorite classic blues player? Um, and before we get to that, I wanted to just ask this question because you mentioned Joe Bonamassa before, and I just as I was doing my research leading up to uh, this interview with you, um, I saw that there was some little blurb online about something about a month ago about Joe Bonamassa. And I just wanted to ask you if you wanted to talk about that or comment on that. Cause I know that there was some like press about it. So about, about and it was a bit because like he had done some shred thing and I guess he got react, he reacted to it. Yeah. I think it's, it was one of those things. I mean, uh, you know, I've met Joe a couple of times and I, you know, it's one of those things where I think the internet blows it out of proportion. And, um, you know, <laughs> well, exactly. <laughs> I, I guess news was thin on the ground that day, and uh, <laughs> and they picked up something from the new guy and priest. You know, said something on Twitter to Bonamassa. It's a slow day. Come on, it's got to be a slow day. And you know, I was just talking to you know, as I said, I met Joe a couple of times, and I've got no beef beef with Joe. And as I said in, in what I said to him, he's one of the best guitar players on the planet. You know, um, I just thought he was overreacting really and and i said that and the internet picked it up and yeah yeah <laughs> and, and, and went with it and uh which is fine you know i don't think joe took it any joe wasn't really offended by it and he, he was he was also you know gentlemanly and he was his response so we went back a few times um on twitter which incidentally uh the internet didn't publish mm. you know so, so you know right. like everything that they pick out certain things they don't publish the whole thing which is part of the world we live in but he, he's uh th there's no denying the fact i mean he's a, an incredible player um he, he's, he's a phenomenon really and uh but uh i think it, you know maybe i used words i shouldn't have used but he's, i used words like if i was talking to you guys and we we're talking over a few beers i, I said the same thing you know what right, I mean? so, right, right, right. um but uh hope you know luckily people got some entertainment for the day. I don't know. But, um, <laughs> I don't know. It doesn't take it. I mean, we're guitar players. We create music. Surely it, it's, it's sad really when more emphasis is given on that sort of stuff than the music we create. But, uh, That's for sure. not in his case, obviously he gets a lot of exposure anyway, you know, which is rightly so. But, um, but yeah, a uh, classic blues player. Do you know what? I was, I was never huge into the blues apart from Hendrix. Uh, until again later on, um, I always thought blues was kind of boring. Mm. But that's my that was my young brain, you know. That was I didn't quite know, I didn't understand the nuance of the blues. I didn't understand what the blues was saying. You know, I was into different stuff. I was into Hendrix and um, it, which didn't sound like blues to me. I was into uh, Schenker and Blackmore, which was all based in the blues somewhere, but it didn't sound like that to me. Mm -hmm. So um, I was into Cream. I, I used to like Cream. Um, 
I used to love Clapton before he went solo. I, I thought Clapton was boring when he when he done his own thing. Um, that was just my opinion. Yeah. yeah, again, everyone's scared to have an opinion these days that doesn't fit in with what everyone else thinks. Like, I don't really like Led Zeppelin, but everyone's got to like Zeppelin for some reason. Mm -hmm. If you've got an opinion outside of that, you, you know, whatever. But it's just my opinion. I liked about four or five songs from Zeppelin. wasn't a huge fan. Clapton was the same. Loved him in Cream. Um, so I guess it would have been uh, classic blues player was, would have been would have been Clapton. And again, Hendrix didn't sound like Clap. Uh, this is kicking in now. I've, I've had almost a whole bowl. Of it. Forgive me. I've, already, I've you know it's almost it's almost there. But, um, Hendrix never sounded like blues to me. It sounded like um, something otherworldly. But, yeah, uh, I mean, but, it, I mean, it had elements of blues, certainly, you know, like Voodoo Child and something. But it was just. Yeah, I didn't just, know what that was, though. I didn't, I didn't associate yeah. that with the blues. It's only till later on. And um, I think only now, again, when I'm older, you can appreciate the nuance of blues and what it's saying and where it's coming from. And it's like, oh, OK, mm -hmm. it's like a fine Malou, you know, back when I was 15, I would have down the bottle. Right. You know, and not not appreciated the fine notes uh, yeah. in the wine. Right. And it's it's the same thing with blues. So now, you know, Bonamassa. Again, like Jared James Nichols, he's making a stir. Oh, uh, he's Tom great. Bryant. Yeah, yeah man. He, uh, larger than life, you know. Um, he's got his own signature Epiphone as well, you know. And I think maybe, uh, I don't know why, he's always played his gifts in old glory. Um, maybe he took the same approach to get his guitar and that brand in the hands of, of the masses rather than doing a, a Gibson an expensive signature model. Yeah yeah, yeah. 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 Now he's, I saw him at NAM and I was, I stopped. I was like, this guy's, he's got the feel. He's just, you know, his, he's playing with yeah. his fingers. He doesn't use a pick. He's just, there's just something very raw and exciting, yeah, yeah. exciting about his playing, you know? Does um, he, do you know what he uses? I know he's got his, um, he's got his own signature amp, his own black star thing. He, he done a thing online the other day. I, it sounded like a fuzz, but I didn't know if it was just the amp compressing. I, I don't know if you guys know what he uses. Well, I'm not exactly sure. I know he has that signature amp coming out or something, but or it's yeah. out. I'm yeah. never... No, and I... he's always been like a single pickup, uh, yeah. like a Leslie West fan, isn't he? So he's always got the, the tone out of his fingers. Yeah, like almost. And so I've seen him play a lot of P90. Mm. Yeah. yeah, pickups. Yeah. Um, uh, Vincent Moretti. Thanks for the contribution to the channel. We appreciate it. Uh, he says, good evening, gentlemen. My eight-year-old son, Julian, is hanging out with his dad tonight and wanted to say he really loves the show. Cheers. That's cool. That's good parenting right there, um, even though it's kind of late. I, I, hope, I hope he didn't watch the, sh the show, the last one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That might have been a parental. Awful lot of swearing in that one. <laughs> I'm going to watch that now. I'm going to go back and watch that. Oh, you know. it's funny. You're going to see me get completely pissed. <laughs> I'll check that out. It's good. After about two and a half hours, then it starts going downhill for me. <laughs> Excellent. But Excellent. there's some great stuff in it. There's oh, some cool. great stories, man. Really yeah. good stories. Have really. you seen Especially the firing stories, the Aussie firing stories? Oh, really? Oh, there's some there's some gems in there. Yeah. I was just talking, uh, just thinking. Um, you know, like there's a lot of stuff online now with people just talking. And it's 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 amazing what you can get from people just talking. Have you seen the Joe Rogan um, interview with David Lee Roth? I, I saw some of it. Yes. Yeah, me too. The, the whole thing is just amazing. What what an amazing character that guy is. The yeah. world need. The, I mean, we've done. We do. You know. You know. We do press conferences, and uh, so we go there. Uh, the last thing. The last one we done, I think, was in uh, Colombia, and so you know, there's a. Uh, a line of us, so there's us and Halloween, I think there was, and Arch Enemy, and a group of photographers and press, and they were all um, asking us questions. And it was fairly low key, it was fairly, uh, uh, what's the word, amicable, nice, and whatever. The world, the world needs more David Lee Roth. If David Lee Roth was in that room, it would have been fun, it would have been like wild. The world needs more of that. And watching that uh, Joe Rogan interview, I just thought, what an interesting character. He's full of stories. Mm -hmm. um, whatever people might say about Lee Roth in terms of his singing or whatever, I think he's just a fantastic front man. Um, great for, for that 
incarnation of Van Halen and just a, just a great guy to to learn from and listen to. He's done so much more with his no, life. He's a smart, just smart man. Totally, man. I just thought it was amazing to listen to. And, you know, hats off to, to Joe Rogan for having, having him on the show, you know. Yeah. Yeah, da- yeah, I mean, Dave is a really smart guy. I mean, he's he almost reminds me a bit of, like, you know, uh, Robin Williams or, you know, like that his brain is constantly going. He almost has a little bit of OCD where he's just, yeah. you know, jumping from one thing to the other. But he's just he's just so smart. Um, and he's such a creative guy. And, uh, you know, regardless, like you said, of what people may say about David Lee Roth singing, whether it be now or in the past, uh, yeah. he, he had the attitude. He knew how to write great, great melodies. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, he was just, you know, a music, in my opinion, a musical genius. I mean, a great front man, amazing front man. Well, part of what we do is communicate. And, you know, if you can't, he was a great communicator. Mm-hmm. He might not have been the best tech, he, he wasn't Freddie Mercury. But he, he could communicate that music better than anyone at that time. Yeah. You know what I mean? So there's a lot to be said for that. Yeah, I need to watch the rest of the uh, the, the Joe Rogan interview. Um, it's fantastic. Yeah, someone did someone did a like a 30 second clip of like all the like you know just like strange moments from that interview, and it, yeah. I, and it was just like you know if you watch that. You're almost like, whoa, what is Dave smoking? But of course, <laughs> but but oh, he's probably know. smoking something. <laughs> uh, I tell you, tell I what's interesting smoking. about it though is a lot of what he's saying is about what we all do behind closed doors, and I think he calls it banking. So like where where he comes up with the ideas for this title or this song lyric or whatever it was, he whenever he's in a restaurant or he's in a situation, he write it down and he, he banks it, hmm. you know. Um, and I think one of the quotes is something around, um, you know, there's so much more that goes into that right hook than the right hook. It's the stuff that goes into that in the training and the preparation. And it's what we all do, you know, at home, you're playing at home, the rehearsal, the writing, get, the writing songs. And the, what you see on stage is a combination of that stuff behind closed doors you know, that no one gets to see. Um, and I think that, that was a great that was a great lesson to learn, you know, or great thing to hear someone say. Um, because it's true, that, that culmination in all that practice, uh, all the dedication is there on stage or there in the boxing ring, you know. Right. And, uh, you know, so right. it, inspirational, really. Yeah, that actually reminds me of, like, the image of, like, an iceberg. Uh, yeah. You know, exactly. just the iceberg, you only see the, just the little tip of the iceberg, but underneath is this giant piece of ice, right? You know, so it's all that all that work that led up to that just little piece just coming out to the top. So um, Exactly that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's cool. So, um, yeah, really inspirational thing, but, you know. Yep, yeah, there's a lot of work that goes up to that that preparation. Yeah, like they say, how do you get how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, 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 right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, we have uh, another super chat, or a couple more. Go ahead, here. Dave. I'm gonna just run to the restroom if I, you don't mind. Uh, uh, Justin Espinosa goes positive, negative of carbon fiber in next. Would you? Uh, I would. Uh, uh, sometimes we put carbon fiber rods, like stiffening rods, like I know PV used to down some of the guitars in, in the neck. Yeah. I the I, you know. You'd have to directly compare that, but how how would you? I, I, Sonically, I would that... just. I think, yeah. I mean, honestly, I don't really have the answer for you, but I wouldn't do it personally. Well, I've got one guitar that does have carbon fiber rods in the neck, but that's only because it was a '74 Les Paul Custom, mm-hmm. and I was in Holland. Broke the headstock. I broke the headstock. I got a bit. I had a few too many shandies. And I threw the guitar up in the air, and I didn't catch it, and I missed it, and it it went down in the pit head first. Whoops! Yeah, and the headstock shattered, and it was about the third time that the headstock had broken off. So it was more glue than wood. It was yeah. like Darth Vader, you know, like Darth Vader's more machine yeah. now than man. It was like more, it was more glue than wood. So. We- yeah, we've talked about this before, but I think oh, sometimes broken headstock guitars are better sounding. Well, this one had been broken about three or four times, and people say it's stronger. 
yeah. then it, I, I, I can't vouch for that. I mean, I, I broke it a few times, even though it had been repaired. So the, the, the last time it got repaired, I had to take the neck off. There was no, it was splintered in a thousand pieces. It was brittle because of the glue. Yeah. Because of the, the wood had dried out. It was brittle. There was no, there was no putting it back together. Yeah. So, and it was a, it was a, I mean, you know, we were talking earlier on about, you know, that first Strat copy, the first Epiphone. Yeah. My first Les Paul was uh, a, a 1974 um, Les Paul custom. And it was white and it was nice and um, nice and yellowed. Uh, but a friend of mine calls it pub ceiling nicotine yellow, which is, <laughs> yeah. which is exactly, you know, back in the day when you could smoke in bars, the ceiling used to be like this thick, yellowy brown. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's what color it was. It's like a Randy Rhodes sort of, you know. Yeah, I was, gonna speak, um, yeah, I was just about to say the Randy Rhodes Les Paul. Like, exactly. Yeah. Some of those yellow severely. Though. Yeah, they did, they did. This one was, I mean, this one was, this one was yellow, but it was, uh, again, it was the first Les Paul that I, you know, my father bought me, um, and I, you know, I didn't want to sort of throw it away. The, the neck, uh, Mark, I was just saying, I, I, I smashed the neck for the la uh, headstock for the last time, really, mm. and uh, because of the sentiment, sentimental value, um, I got it re-necked, and that was the only way of doing it. And we were talking about carbon fiber rods in in a, in a neck, oh, I and see. Uh, and to, you know, based on my history smashing guitars they thought it was wise to put two carbon fiber rods <laughs> in the neck you know other than that i don't know if i'd do it but uh you know in in this circumstance it seemed to be you know just to, so it wouldn't happen again basically was why i did it or maybe just less shandies less, do you know what the last time i uh i know you're right <laughs> you're right <laughs> you're right i can't i can't talk my way out of that one you're right <laughs> I think the uh, the EVH guitars, uh, the Wolfgangs. Ah, it's done. <laughs> the bottles. I'm, I'm just saying. I mean, I, I, I can talk all night. I'm just saying. I, you know, the bottles empty. The bottles empty. Okay. Well, we're we'll wrap it up. We'll wrap okay, it up. a couple more here. We, so, uh, yeah. Uh, GVB Junior says, "What home gear do you use, and how does it impact your creative process?" Well, you use the Pink Taco. Pink Taco, and you know, it's a good question because I think. Whatever's fun, whatever's fun impacts your creative process because you always come out with riffs and stuff when you're having, when it's fun, mm -hmm. you know, when it's a chore or you're, you know, it's hard to pinpoint what it is, where the, where the riffs and ideas come from. But um, definitely if you're having fun and you, you're enjoying a sound, um, that's, that's key, I find. Uh, and you, you might come up with an idea initially on, as I said, the taco and a strap, mm. or you might wake up in the morning, have a coffee, and pick up a an SG or a, a, a P90 Les Paul, whatever it might be, whatever takes your fancy. You, you, I think whatever your whatever. I know what I'm trying to say. I'm not saying it very well, but like whatever facilitates that in the most natural way. So I want to play this guitar with this sound and through that, you're kind of free and it inspires you to come up with stuff. Mm -hmm. And then hey. you might, you might re-record that with another guitar or another amp or whatever it is. But so that definitely affects me creative process. And as I said earlier on that fucking 20 watt, and it was an afterthought. I, I was in Guitar Center, and there, there's a gold strap. I've got, I don't know where it is. There's a gold strap somewhere. Right. And they had a beautiful a gold strap on the wall, and underneath it, they had this Friedman display. So they had a, a taco, they had a brown eye, they had a whatever, you know, beautiful names you've got for your stuff. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and he said, uh, What do you want to play it through? And I said, Well, whatever's closest, that will do. And it, it happened to be the taco. And I put it through it, and it was like, how can I walk away with anything but this combination of stuff? <laughs> because it was the same thing. It was fun. It felt right. It, it interacted with each other. Um, and that's what it's about, really. You know, it's what – have you seen that um, – there's a, there's, a, there's a program. I don't know if it's on Netflix, and it's this little Japanese woman. And uh, if it sparks joy, you should keep it. Her name's Mary Kondo. Oh, 
Oh yeah, it, it, it's not Very, the show where she uh, organizes people's. She places. organizes. So you go through your closets and you, you get your you get your clothes out of the closet, <laughs> and if it sparks joy, you keep it. So it's the same kind of thing. If you get, there's a combination of things. If it sparks joy, that's that's what you use. Hmm. You know, whether it's a Marshall or a Gibson or a, a Taco, whatever it was, and it was it was it. That was that was what sparked joy at that moment. So I, I had to I had to get it all, and uh, so it definitely impacts the, the creative process. If if you're free to play, and if you've got something in your head that you need to express, and your equipment isn't impeding that in any way, that's that's the key. And uh, so yeah, it, it, it definitely. So to answer to answer the question, at the moment it's usually the taco. Um, and a strat at the moment. I'm, I'm going through a strat phase. I've got one there. I was just playing that earlier on. Going through a strat phase, whatever it is. And now it seems to be the strat. So uh, that's cool. Do you record? Question. Do you record at home? I record ideas. Yeah, yeah. Um, I record sort of uh, riffs. And I usually, what I usually do is come up in the morning, get a coffee, sit down, get a get a guitar, put it in, and. Uh, and jam around and some things jump out and if something jumps out i come to the computer put it down mm. and um and sometimes i put it to bed sometimes i embellish it you know put some drums on it put some bass on it and those are the things that you you never know you never know where they're going to end up you know it could be the s simplest of ideas and you put it down and you get sparked into another idea and it becomes a song and it becomes it becomes a song and a record. It becomes part of someone's day, you know. Uh, yeah. You, you, like, fortunately, I've, I've got the opportunity to do that, you know. So if, if we're doing another record, some things that I've recorded in the last couple of weeks might show up on the record. They might show up in the writing sessions. And, uh, they might show up on the way to a gig in, in three years' time or so, you know. So, But it's getting back to what you're saying, it, it's, it's definitely the instrument and whatever makes you feel creative and happy and it doesn't impede that process right that's awesome um one helps too <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> i bet um we have we have another super chat day this was question for dave when can we expect the jj20 for sale that's the jerry cantrell 21 june, june i think release june 6th i think so that's when i've got a question yeah when can we expect the the brown eye 100 deluxe well so i saw that i saw that in them i, I saw you, it and you, you played know, it in my shop it. yes oh that that was that one <laughs> yeah that was that one by the way i was trying to be all secretive about that but you just blown me cover but yeah yeah so, <laughs> and can we expect it in white uh sure of course no, but when is when is the uh the actual release date for it uh the actual release date for the vast majority of people will be um later in june it's just the whole process you have to you know once you have all the parts and stuff you have to start making um you have to start making them and then start shipping them, but you have to get a good amount of them before you start shipping them to all the stores. And then some stores it takes X amount of time to get to. So you want to time the release date so stores actually have them. And, Makes sense. And then some stores always go and start to sell it before they're supposed to. And oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> and then we always have to smack their wrists and <laughs> tell them you can't do that yet. So interesting yeah well, that's cool that's cool um i want to be respectful of your time richie thank you i mean i think we've gone through all the okay. questions um that we have this has been an amazing discussion with you uh i can't thank you enough for coming on the show um, Pleasure. and um you know can you give us some more information about what's next for judas priest and for you coming up well yeah we're um as I said earlier, we're we're gearing up for the the next um, and I think final run 
of the firepower tour, barring the rescheduled Aussie dates. You know, we're going to get back to the UK at some stage with the firepower tour uh, to the UK and, and Europe. Um, but we're gearing up for the, the last US run at the moment. So um, that is that's starting in Hollywood on May the third. And uh, we've got some surprises. We've got, uh, it's the third, as I said, the third time we're in the States this year. So, or this leg, this cycle. So we've got to, we've got to do some different things, you know. Um, some people have seen the show before. Mm -hmm. So we don't want them to see the same show again. So we're looking at new songs. Um, some songs have already been, um, I think Rob um, leaked a few songs. You know, we're doing songs like Out in the Cold, um, Killing Machine. Mm. The Sentinel, we're bringing back. Um, we're doing songs like All Guns Blazing, um, and some songs off the new record like Traders Gate. Oh, great! Um, Necromancer, songs like that. Oh, um, nice. Hopefully, hopefully, they, hopefully they don't fire me for saying that. But uh, and also, you know, <laughs> the, the great thing about this tour so far is that we've been throwing in new tracks, you know, as we go through the tour. So. Um, you know, if anyone's got any suggestions on the socials, reach out, throw in some suggestions and uh, tell us what you want. But uh, we're gearing up for that that tour at the moment. And um, yeah, that's it really. And um, we kick off on May the 3rd and then we go right through, we go through Canada, North America, and then we finish in Vegas at the joint at the end of June. So uh, wow. we're coming through LA as well. Um, so yeah, it'll, it'll be great. So, as I said, it's a, it's a new production. Um, new stage set, um, new songs. So uh, it's, it's exciting. So um, That's awesome. hopefully we'll see some, uh, some of you out there. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, you guys make sure you go see the, the Judas Priest tour kicking off in Hollywood May 3rd. Um, Richie, you're fantastic. You're just uh, you're a gentleman. Uh, Thanks, guys. Yeah, you're fantastic, man. Awesome. Dave, thank you. Uh, Richie, just hang on while we um, while we wrap up. And when we end okay. the show, we'll just uh, say our final goodbyes. Um, just as some uh, notifications for the for people, I believe the next show we have is um, I'm confirming it is Steve Ferris from Mister Mister, um, and that's May uh, no April 26th, and then May 10th we have Mike Tempesta from uh artist relations of charvel jackson and evh and uh he's also with power uh, what, what was the name of that power man 5000 i believe what what was yeah yep yep so uh we're looking excited to have mike tempesta on the show um and uh we've got a whole bunch of other folks uh chris van tassel and um guthrie trap uh chris van tassel's from j rocket audio pedals um Dave, I met, I connected with uh, Pete Thorne and Holly Henderson. Yeah. Uh, to potentially have them on the show and promote her album. Um, oh, that'd be great. Yeah. yeah I yeah. know about that. It was pretty much recorded here with me. Yeah. Cool. I'd love to. I'd love to have Holly on the show. So, so great. lots of lots of great stuff coming up, guys. And uh, Richie's finishing his wine. So we are. Um, I'm it's finishing done. finishing the last <laughs> sip of my beer. You guys are a bad influence. Oh, mm -hmm. shoot. I got water. Wait. There you go. <laughs> we're all, we're all <laughs> done. So you guys have a great weekend. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Richie, just hang on one more second. I'm just going to hit the finish button. And uh, you guys have a great weekend. Take care, everybody. Thanks. Nice.